Next, we take you up to Capitol Hill for a hearing focusing on the impact of President Clinton's health care reform proposal on women's health programs. Members of the House Government Operations Schroeder of Colorado, Democrat Cardis Collins of Illinois, and Republican Barbara Vukanovich of Nevada. Members also heard from representatives of the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute, Planned Parenthood, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. The subcommittee is chaired by Democratic Congressman Edolphus Towns of New York. Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernment Relations of the House Committee on Government Operations, please come to order. This begins the subcommittee's hearing on the standard health benefit package and its impact on women's health. Today we are focusing on coverage of pap tests, mammographies <coughs> under the administration's health proposal. The experts, and many of them we have here with us today, agree that the most effective way to decrease mortality rates from cervical and breast cancer is through annual pap tests. The public health service attributes 75 percent of the decline in cervical cancer mortality rates in this country to the pap test. The pap test is internationally recognized as the most effective screening tool to detect cervical cancer. And both the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute recommend annual pap tests for all women regardless of age. The President's plan, however, states that coverage for pap tests will be limited to once every three years. After three annual negative exams and after the age of 65, no coverage at all. I ask the American people to consider the outrageousness of this last point and the suggestion that women cervix is not deserving of basic insurance coverage after the age of 65. Our timing for this hearing could not have been better. This month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, Liz Claiborne outlets have gotten the message. You know, they have indicated that we should recognize uh, the fact that uh, they have gotten into the act and they understand it. I think that those of us who serve in the Congress should definitely understand it. Not only did Liz Claiborne get in the act, Avon, uh, the catalog, the Glamour magazine, they got into the act and said that, uh, uh, that they felt that this is something that we should take very serious note. So uh, we'd like to thank uh, Claiborne and also Avon for making certain that we all get the message. But now we have to make certain that the Congress gets the message and to make certain that the White House gets the message and make certain that those in funding levels also get the message as well. The message is finally getting out to women all over the country. Start having mammograms every one to two years after the age of 40. And now that the message is in the, our department stores, in the media, cons consciousness is being raised. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The administration's plans come out proposing mammography coverage for women starting at the age of 50. Send a total different message from the one breast cancer groups have worked so hard to publicize. A message contrary to the American Cancer Society's guidelines. The administration plans tells women that before the age of 50, the risk of breast cancer isn't significant enough for our national health plan. It tells these women, don't worry, but let me say in a very loud and clear voice that breast cancer is something to worry about. Breast cancer is on the rise in this country. More than half of a million women will die of breast cancer during this decade. One in every 10 American women will have breast cancer in her lifetime. Today we will hear testimony telling us that women in their 30s even get breast cancer. 
and that breast cancer is the number one cancer killer of young black women. Until we begin to win the war against breast cancer, we cannot discourage preventative care and cancer screening. We must encourage, not discourage. Today, we have gathered medical and women's health experts to discuss the science behind mammograms and pap tests and the policy implication if these cancer screenings are rationed under the health plan. As you can see from the witness list, we have an ambitious agenda. We will apply the five-minute rule to all testimony, ask for everyone's cooperation, adhering to this rule. I look forward to hearing from all of our distinguished witnesses. But before I move to, uh, to witnesses, let me recognize the minority leader of the subcommittee, gentleman from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will begin by observing your admonition on time so that we can hear our colleagues who are waiting to testify. I can't resist, however, saying that you couldn't have said it better when you said the timing of this hearing uh, could not have been better. I think it's quite clear that the administration and the members of the 103rd Congress intend to seriously consider uh, major changes in health care policy in the United States uh, during the course of this Congress. And although I do not know what the final product of that consideration will be, I know that we have to be sure not to leave women's health in the background. Although statistics overwhelmingly show that the majority of individuals, uh, individual patient visits to doctors are by women. Uh, I've heard, heard report after report that government-funded medical studies have, to have had a tendency to focus on men's health uh, and follow men in terms of uh, research more than women. So it's an obvious contradiction between who is seeing doctors more often and who the government is following in terms of health care studies. So I appreciate this hearing and appreciate our colleagues being here to testify. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Schiff. I now yield to Mr. Sanders, from, uh, who has been very involved in these issues for quite some time. Congressman Sanders. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. And I uh, want to congratulate you on your continued efforts to focus this country on cancer and cancer prevention. Uh, the pain and suffering of breast and cervical cancer survivors and families who have lost their mothers, sisters, and daughters to these cancers is particularly acute in my district, the state of Vermont, for a reason that we do not know and that we are exploring. In general, the cancer rate is very high in Vermont, and for both breast and cervical cancers among white women, Vermont ranked eighth in the nation. Uh, and let me just jump into the concern about the pap test. And that is, since the introduction of the pap test, as you indicated, the national death rate for cervical cancer has fallen 75 percent. The administration's proposal, which covers pap smears every three years after three annual negative tests, goes against both <clears throat> the National Cancer Institute and American Cancer Society's recommendations of annual pap tests for all women. And while I'm aware of studies that make recommendations similar to the administration's, this recommendation fails to recognize that we live in an imperfect world. It fails to recognize that the effectiveness of the pap test has repeatedly been called into question because of poor lab results and or inadequate screening procedures. In one of the worst examples of misread pap tests, a September 27, 1993 article in the New York Times reported that an independent laboratory in Rhode Island is rechecking 19,000 cancer tests performed at Newport Hospital after a woman died of cervical cancer after receiving four repeated pap tests, pap, pap test misreadings at the hospital. Of the 1,190 pap smears rechecked so far, 17 cases were found where women were told they did not have cancer when the tests actually indicated early signs of cervical cancer. Let me simply conclude by looking forward to the testimony of our colleagues from the House uh, and congratulating you for pursuing this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Sanders. Uh, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to welcome three outstanding members of Congress, three women that uh, are leaders in uh, so many areas in the Congress, but I'm just so happy for them to come and to <clears throat> share with us this morning. Uh, let me begin by uh, introducing first Congresswoman Cardis Collins uh, uh, from the state of Illinois, 
And of course, she's joined by uh, Congresswoman Pat Schroeder uh, from the uh, state of Colorado. And of course, uh, Congresswoman Barbara Vukanovic uh, from the great state of Nevada. So we're delighted to uh, have you. Uh, so why don't we, uh, you know in terms of how we proceed, I don't have to talk about that with you, uh, but I would like for you maybe Congresswoman uh, Woman Collins, Collins to re uh, begin, and of course uh, with the five minute rule in mind and allowing us an opportunity to be able to raise some questions. It's a delight to have you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the other members of the committee for allowing me to testify today on women's health care needs under the Clinton Health Plan. Although recently we have seen an upsurge in interest in this all-important area, it has been overlooked for such a long time that even the recent interest doesn't begin to offset the years of medical neglect that women have experienced. Clearly, this commemorate, clearly we must do something about this. A major issue affecting women's health is the rapid growth in the number of women affected by breast cancer. In my state of Illinois, there will be an estimated 8,700 new cases of breast cancer this year. During 1993, about 2,200 Illinois women will die from the disease. Because of the growth of this killer, I have sponsored a commemorative resolution declaring October as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month every year for the past four years. It seems that clearly this commemorative has been effective in increasing the public's knowledge about this disease. But fighting breast cancer requires more than awareness. If we are to make any real gains, we must also redouble the resources which we commit to this disease. I am pleased that this Congress and our President has made some strides in increasing the research funds available to study cancer, breast cancer. Public Law 10343, enacted in June of this year, allows for an increase in the emphasis placed on this disease and others that affect women. These increases will provide a marked improvement in the resources available for health professionals studying breast cancer. Unfortunately, we have yet to make commensurate strides in providing access and payment for preventative services. We have yet to put our money where our mouth is in paying for preventive screening, which is the best way to ensure a good prognosis for the women affected by this disease. Since the 94th Congress, I've sponsored legislation which would require states to provide coverage of breast and cervical cancer screening as a basic service under their Medicaid programs. Currently, these procedures are covered as diagnostic tools, but are not required to be covered as preventive measures. This distinction between diagnostic and prevention is an important one. By only covering visits on a diagnostic basis, we are prohibiting some poor women from going to their doctors for pap tests or mammograms on a regular basis as suggested by the guidelines established by the American Cancer Society and other experts in this field. In my view, this is a tragedy. Many poor women who happen to be African American are particularly disadvantaged by this Medicaid policy because although they have a lower incidence of breast cancer, studies show that African American women are more likely to die from this disease because they receive fewer mammograms and therefore do not detect the disease until it's in its latest stages. You can be sure that a chief reason that we do not receive these important screening tests is because they can't afford them. This situation just has to be corrected. I'm hopeful that as we reform our health care system, we will address this problem. Presently, the President's proposed health plan will provide women over the age of 50 free mammograms without copayment or deductibles every other year. This is a good start, but not sufficient for women who are at high risk of having this disease. The American Cancer Society considers all women over the age of 50 as the highest risk group for breast cancer. Consequently, it recommends they receive annual mammograms. In my state of Illinois, private insurance plans now cover early detection mammograms, and unless the Clinton plan includes these preventive uh, mammograms in its proposal, many women who have private insurance will take a giant step backward in their coverage under a new national health care plan. Last week in testimony before a joint hearing of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee that I chair on Commerce, Consumer Protection and Competitiveness, and the Subcommittee on Health and Environment that Mr. Waxman chairs, I received a commitment from Secretary Shalala that the President's plan would cover mammograms for women according to the current standards that are generally recognized as adequate for women. I expect that when I receive the legislation for the health proposal, it will provide broad coverage for these tests. There are some who doubt the need for yearly mammograms for women who fall in certain age categories. 
I understand that the verdict is out on whether the number of cancers detected outweighs the number of healthy women who must be screened. What, are we, what we all have to remember, however, is that early screening saves lives. To the child whose mother has been saved by early detection, the cost is negligible. Mr. Chairman, in her testimony before the Congress, Mrs. Clinton remarked that more should be done on this health care issue. She said that she was, quote, a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, and a woman, end quote. Because of all these roles, I am sure Mrs. Clinton and those who are working with her recognize the importance of these women's health issues. Every year the numbers increase. More of our mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters are diagnosed with this disease. Early detection can clearly increase the odds of their survival. I'll be watching closely to try to ensure that the broadest and most inclusive um, po policy possible is adopted in the health plan that we vote on in this Congress. And once again, I thank the committee and the subcommittee for allowing me to address you on this topic. You are to be commended for the interest you have shown in this matter and yield back the balance of my time. All right. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Collins. At this time, call on Congresswoman Schroeder. Thank you very much, Congressman Towns, and I want to thank your committee for focusing on this, and you're right, it couldn't be more timely, and we really appreciate it. As you know, as the co-chair of the Women's Caucus, that has been a major focus of our interest for the last of five years, has been women's health, because it has been so neglected. And the caucus has met with Hillary Clinton and members of the task force and been doing a lot of homework on this. And of course, we were very disappointed to find out um, when the initial drafts came over that they were talking about mammograms every other year after the age of 50 and pap smears every three years after you had had three negative ones. Now, why were we upset about that? We really feel that women should be under medical care and scientific care, not political rationing. And that has been our problem. If men had to listen to the three of us debate, how often are we going to let men be examined for prostate cancer? Uh, we don't want to know what the medical people say. We just want to say we only have so much money and that's where we're going to save the money. I think men would be very offended and say, who do those three women think they are? If we're going to have health care, we don't want to listen to them. We want to listen to the medical and scientific community. So therefore, we really want to make sure women are treated the same way men are treated and that we are getting the best medical advice that is available at that time as to what preventive care is needed. And that's what we want men to have, and that's what we want women to have, and we really don't need political advice from congressmen or senators or anything else. Um, if the rationing ends up being on 51 percent of the population, I think a lot of us are going to have a lot of trouble backing this bill. It is very clear that preventive ha measures save us megabucks long term. And so we ought to have these preventive measures. And let me tell you, as someone who's been through mammograms and pap smear, if the fear is that if the taxpayer covers these, women are going to run out and get as many as they can, let me assure you that it isn't going to happen because it is not a very pleasant test to have and the incentive is not, gee, somebody's paying for it. So, gee, why don't we go again? You ready? <laughs> I don't think I can sell any woman in this room on that. So, uh, as you know, breast, aware, or breast Cancer Awareness Week and everything else, or month, is about trying to get people to overcome this anxiety about these tests. It's about trying to get people to go in routinely every year and check up. And the same with pap smears. And we're undoing the whole thing if we're saying, yes, you should do that, but the federal government doesn't think it's important enough to pay for it every year or whatever. So we're really hoping this gets solved and many other problems in there. We've got some other problems in there dealing with women in health. But that's our bottom line. We don't want to end up finding out we have to go buy a private policy for our private parts. And men have all their private parts and their other parts in the public sector. You know, we ought to have all our parts in the public sector and they can have all their parts in the public sector. And the idea about calling out the private parts and putting them in the private sector is just not acceptable. So we're working hard on that and we've had a long time um, effort working to make sure that mammography and pap, pap smears are uniform. I thought uh, Congressman Sanders' stories were 
horror shows. The only thing worse than not having a mammogram is having a bad mammogram. The only thing worse than not having a pap smear is having a bad pap smear. So we must make sure that there are high quality standards too. But that's why we're here. We thank you for letting us come in. We want to do everything we can to work with you. And we're delighted that you had the concern at this very, very propitious time to bring this to the forefront of the American public so we can make sure we're not chasing the train, we're on the train when it leaves the station. Right. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Schroeder. At this time, we call on Congresswoman Vukanovic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. And I agree with my colleagues. I certainly appreciate this opportunity to testify before this subcommittee as an elected representative, a woman, a mother, and a 10-year survivor of breast cancer. You know, a decade ago, when I first came to Congress, I discovered I had breast cancer. Or to be accurate, a mammogram detected that I had breast cancer. I knew about breast self-exam and the usefulness of mammography, but no doctor had ever recommended that I get a mammogram, so I didn't. Uh, until that fateful day when my physician discovered a lump in my breast and encouraged me to get a mammogram, I'm glad he did because I feel that that mammogram saved my life. I'm proof positive that mammography works. It saves lives. Uh, that's why Congress has to continue to provide coverage for these screening tests through Medicare and must initiate co uh, coverage through the Medicaid system. More than 150 members of Congress agree with me and have co-sponsored legislation that I've introduced this Congress to provide coverage of these tests for lower income women and older women. Without this coverage, women will die from breast cancer. 4,000 women this year in New York, 225 women in New Mexico, 200 women in my own state of Nevada, and the numbers continue to grow to an outrageous figure of 46,000 women this year nationwide. 46,000 women, mothers, children, wives, and friends. I think we all admit that no cure exists for breast cancer, but it doesn't have to exist, although it doesn't yet exist, although I'm hoping and praying every day so that my daughters and granddaughters and even great-granddaughter might have a chance against this devastating disease which runs in families. Until that time, detection is the only way to stop breast cancer in early stages when it can be better treated. Mammography is an essential part of a three-point plan for early detection of breast cancer as recommended by the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute. A monthly breast self-exam, a clinical exam by a physician, and a baseline mammogram after the age of 40. For women 50 or older, an annual mammogram is recommended. With these recommendations by renowned professional medical organizations, I cannot for the life of me understand why the administration offers substandard coverage for screening mammographies in its health care proposal. To date, the administration's health reform proposal will allow women to obtain a mammogram only once every two years after the age of 50. When questioned on this coverage, the administration has expanded this coverage to a more frequent basis, quote, when it is medically necessary. And what does the term medically necessary mean? Does it mean when a woman is at high risk because her mother had breast cancer? Or does it mean when a woman finds a lump? Or it just, does it just mean being a woman? I say that we cannot wait that long. Women must have this test on an annual basis as a tool for early detection. Breast cancer cannot be prevented, but catching it early enough is the only chance for women, and mammography is that chance. You know, last weekend I, I hosted a breast cancer public education fair to share information on early detection and legislative efforts on this issue. And I met a very wonderful, caring woman who was willing to share her story. She was a professional model and she was, as you can imagine, a very attractive woman on the outside, but more than that on the inside. And she, she talked to total strangers about her experience with cervical cancer resulting in a hysterectomy a few years later, breast cancer of the left breast, resulting in a mastectomy, and a couple of years after that, cancer in her right breast. As she held back the tears, she stated that cancer had made her realize that all she had missed during her life of assumed achievement and described her motivation to continue her life and help others. 
But as we talk about pap smears and, uh, and Congressman Sanders' uh, story, is, it just makes my blood run cold to hear that these things do happen. But I, I think as we talk about these things, mammograms and pap smears, I think that I keep thinking I wouldn't have ever met this lovely woman if these tests hadn't been available to her. They saved her life, and her life has taken on a new purpose. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and my colleagues, I'm asking you and all of my colleagues to ask for and demand more frequent coverage for early detection tests for breast cancer and pap smears in whatever health care package that comes forward. We are talking about lives. They're not just numbers on a page. They are women like me and like my colleagues here and thousands of other women who just want a chance to live. So I thank you again for holding this hearing. I think all of us are aware. Uh, I had one woman talk about she thought that we were scaring women to death by talking about breast cancer, but I don't think, maybe we need to do that, but I think uh, your holding this hearing is wonderful to have an opportunity to be heard. So thank you very much. But let me thank all three of you for your testimony and also to thank you for the leadership that you provided uh, you know, through that, down through the years. And uh, of course, I think that it's something that we all have to get very, very involved in to make certain that whatever package is finally put together, that uh, it does not ignore or leave a group out. And I think that uh, the way to do it is to sort of have hearings like this and to make certain that this information is available and that the, co the community at large is aware of some of the problems that we have in terms of the overall health package. And uh, you're doing a fantastic job in doing that. Let me just sort of raise uh, one question with you. Uh, what kind of message uh, does the plan send out to women, particularly low-income women, when it covers uh, pap tests and mammograms in such a limited fashion when it just sort of almost sort of says was well, fine if you do if you don't type of uh, arrangement which really the plan does at this particular time so what do you think this message to the uh, low income uh, and especially in terms of black community well I think it says to uh, low income women and to African American women in particular that uh, the country doesn't care about their health I think it says to them that you know, we can't give you preventive care, but then we are willing to put you in the hospital if you're at the point of death where your uh, cancer has to be treated very extraordinarily. I think it's a wrong signal that's being sent. I think that preventive medicine is, should be the wave of the future. I believe that to wait until a person has found out that they already have cancer, that cancer has metastasized, and that we're then spending much more money than is necessary to keep that person living comfortably until God decides to take that person away, is not fulfilling the mission of being a true caring country. I think that to, tell, to, to give this suggestion to any person that preventive care is not the kind of care we want to give you, is not in keeping with a good democracy, is certainly not medically correct, and I think it's something we should not do. Well, I, I totally agree, and I think preventive medicine is something that people are becoming more aware that it does save money, and we certainly need to do that. But to, to uh, really reach a lot of these people, we need to have an open dialogue. And I think, as you've noticed in the last couple of years, that certainly a lot of the companies that uh, pay for television have made this uh, an open discussion and an open subject for people. And, uh, we certainly have got to reach the people who need to be reached on this issue, and a lot of them literally don't know or feel they can't afford a mammogram or a pap smear. And you know, I, I think cost is uh, is a factor. It shouldn't be a factor for people. They would say, "Well, gee, I have to go to the grocery store, and I I can't afford to have a mammogram." That is a wrong message, and I think we need to help them pay for it. I would agree with everything and just add one more thing, and that is I think if the federal government is saying to people that, uh, you know, we're not going to pay for these except randomly or every so often, I think they're communicating they're not very important, that the tests aren't very important, or maybe that there isn't the scientific backup that we know there is as to how important these are. So I think it sends all the wrong messages, like it's something you can do if you really want to, but it's almost like a designer test or something. Um, and, and I think the scientific data that you're going to hear later on, but it's so overwhelming that this really does help prevent 
catastrophic disease and, and this early screening is so very important. And the, uh, the widespread, how widespread it is in our society, it's amazing to me that you could think anybody could have an adequate physical and not cover these. So I, I think it really sends a very confused message. Right, thank you very much. Uh, at this time I yield to Congressman Schiff, ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to again thank our colleagues for offering to be witnesses here today. Um, I, I have to say uh, that I'm concerned that the entire plan, once we receive it in the form of a bill from the administration, may in fact turn out to be political rationing because it's the government was going to define what the benefit levels are for all Americans who are participants, which is about all Americans. If we do in fact adopt such a plan, uh, I certainly agree with the witnesses that we want to be sure that scientific evidence and not political uh, de decision making uh, establishes these levels. Uh, I, I would like to say since we do not yet have a specific bill from the administration, but we do certainly have their, their concepts stated many times, I'd like to at, ask the witnesses uh, two questions. No, it seems to me no matter what level we set for mammography, there will always be those individual women patients who feel personally that they wish to get a, a mammogram more often. For those individuals who can afford to do so, and I understand that raises an economic issue, but for those who can afford to do so, I'd like to ask the witnesses if it's their understanding of the plan from the administration that such individuals will be allowed to privately pay for an additional mammogram if they wish to, or if they can, are not allowed to go past whatever the government level of benefits is? I don't know. Mm. I, have, I don't know the answer to that, uh, Mr. Schiff, and I, I think that it, in a sense that's too bad if that's going to be the case, but at least if people feel they could pay for it and not be prevented from paying for it, but certainly, you know, an annual mammogram is certainly, I would say that as a general rule is plenty, but I really don't know. Let me say this, that on the, um, on the, the uh, joint hearings that we've been having in the Energy and Commerce Committee, the question has been raised somewhat. And it's my understanding that if a person, from, from a step policy standpoint, that if a person uh, beside, wants to do something beside the basic core plan that everybody's going to have, that there will be, they will have the, the, uh, the ability to get some kind of supplemental plan or do some supplemental buying of whatever it is that they need. So if a person decides that they want to have an annual mammogram after age 60, for example, they will be able to do so. There will be nothing to prohibit them from doing that. Um, the second question I have is, the administration's proposal is to enroll people into regional alliances. And regional alliances, I understand it, are not supposed to be larger than a given state boundaries because states are supposed to be the primary administrators. Let us suppose, particularly in a case where, where uh, cancer has been detected, that a patient believes that the best specialist to, to treat that particular cancer, uh, whether it's breast cancer or cervical cancer or any kind of cancer, is a specialist in another state. Will the administration's plan, if, if the witnesses know at this time, allow for individuals under those circumstances to utilize specialists who happen to be in other states than where they reside? Well, I think you know that the plan has not been sent up here in its final form. My understanding is there will be an allowance of a fee-for-service type of plan if that's where they want to go. And obviously fee-for-service means that you're not in an HMO, that you could go other places. So I suppose it just depends on what the final details are, but it appears that they are giving those options um, from the early... Uh, outline that we've seen. Well, as you say, uh, Congresswoman Schroeder, we don't have the, the, the details of the plan yet. I have heard, however, that it may be that even in a fee-for-service option under the plan, that that's limited to physicians who are in the alliance, which is to say physicians who are in the same state as the patient. Uh, I have not heard for sure whether there will be an option under, under certain circumstances to utilize specialists in other states, and I wonder if, if you have any additional information on that. 
I don't have any additional information, but let me say this. I believe a, a question that was quite similar to that came up at the last hearing that we had on Tuesday of this week regarding this. And it's my understanding that uh, if, if states border each other, now I may be all wet, but it's my understanding if states border each other, that perhaps there could be some crossing of lines within a region of alliances. Now, this is the way I understood it to be. Now, I don't know if I could be in Illinois. I, I have the the impression that if I were in Illinois and there was a doctor, or say if I was in Gary, Indiana, and there was a doctor across the, uh, the line in Chicago that I wanted to go to, I could do that. I don't think that it meant that if I'm in Illinois, I could go to New York to a doctor. I don't know if it means that or not, but that has to be clarified. And I think since the question has arisen both here and in our last hearing, I'm sure that somebody will be looking at trying to find an answer to it. Okay. I think it's a reasonable test, and, and we'll have to see what happens. But obviously, if you found the best doctor was in Paris, France, and it happened to be April, there may be a little trouble selling that. The best doctor may be at the specialized clinic, however, uh, and I'm not sure the plan will allow, allow that utilization. Mr. Chairman, thank, I thank the witnesses again. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Schiff. Congressman Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I share Mr. Schiff's concerns about some of the proposed aspects of the Clinton plan and would urge him and hope that he would join myself and 88 other members of the Congress in supporting the single-payer concept. <laughs> I which, consider that, the gentleman we yield, I consider that out of the frying pan, as they say. Well, the single-payer will guarantee freedom of choice for all people and end the discrimination against low-income people. Rich and poor will be treated alike. Secondly, I do want to congratulate um, our guest here today, as you all know, as a result of the women's movement over the last few years, enormous progress has been raised, has been made in raising consciousness on women's health needs. And we are making progress, and the three of you have certainly been leaders in that effort, and I congratulate you. The, the question that I would like to ask is, is, since evidence is inconclusive for mammography for women, over, uh, for women under 50, Shouldn't we be doing larger clinical trials on screening younger women and offer women the choice of coverage without any discrimination against those who can't afford to pay? Does that well, make sense? Congressman Sanders, anything in that area makes sense to me. As you know, the one NIH uh, test that they did on breast cancer, they did on men, um, <laughs> which was a little disconcerting until the congresswomen waited in and started saying enough of this stuff. So obviously we are way behind the curve of where we would like to be in, in having more information. And what my choice would be is that we leave it, that, that the plan ends up being in a form where it can grow as this research comes in and as medical advice comes in. And that's why I think rather than saying how many times and what ages and how often and all of that. What you really want to say is I think the three of us want the best medical advice, period. An understanding that that is a dynamic thing that will be changing, especially vis-a-vis -vis women because it was ignored for so long. So that I think would get us out of the woods in all of that and stop the micromanaging that we tend to love to do when it comes to women. Thank you. And I think we really need to stay with the current guidelines that are put forth by the American Cancer Society and NIH until we see something different, or NCI. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Sanders. Uh, we would like to welcome to the committee and at the same time uh, yield to him. Uh, uh, Congressman Portman from Ohio is a brand new member to the Congress and a brand new member to the committee. We're delighted to have you. I yield now to Congressman Portman. Mr. Chairman, I had no questions, but after that I guess I, I do. Thank you for welcoming me to the subcommittee. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I thank my colleagues for coming this morning. I'm sorry I couldn't have been here for your testimony. Uh, my general question I think has been covered somewhat already, but it is in the area of prevention. I believe firmly that Prevention is a critical part of whatever plan we come up with eventually, and I think the President shares that, as do my colleagues here in the panel. And I guess my question to you is, what should we be doing in the context of this national health care proposal in the area of more education, more consciousness uh, as to women's health issues in the area of prevention? What can we do? Well, I think most women tend to listen to their doctors, and if we end up with a plan that says go with the medical advice and go with what the Cancer Institute and everything is saying, if that's what the plan recommends and says we will cover that, 
Um, I think that's the best way, because they're then getting educated where you want them to be educated, in the, in the medical offices where they go for their care. If instead you have doctors saying, well, I really recommend this, but this isn't covered, so you'll have to pay for it, then they begin to think that there's a conflict. Maybe it's not that important, because we all said prevention was so important, but it, we're not covering it, so it must not be as important as the other things. And I think then we start sending all sorts of, of mixed signals. And I, I think that's why there's just a very simple, clear, bright line that we hope to have come down. And anything other than that, I think it's messy. Well, I think we all, I think everybody in this country is going to have some input on this, this health care uh, plan that there, as we all know, there are several of them out there beside the administrations. And I think, uh, I think it's going to be a healthy uh, discussion all over the country. And I think it has to be because we're asking people to buy into whatever is going to happen in their lives. And so I think that what we can do is to speak out and, and try to have some input into what does finally come out. I think that uh, a great deal of interest is already there. All of us get letters from various groups. We get letters from AARP and from the doctors and from the trial lawyers and from the nurses and so forth. But I'm sure that all of you have received volumes of mail, as have I, from individuals who are concerned about their individual health plans, how it's going to affect them, and so forth. Uh, I'm not a statistician by far, but the, the sheer volume of mail that I have received since the President's speech tells me that mass America knows what is going on, that they want to have more answers here, that they want to educate themselves about what's going on. I dare say that I know from reading our, our Chicago newspapers that most of the members who are uh, in Congress from the Chicago area have already had health care task force meetings. We have been asked to have two or three at different places throughout the district. There's a lot, there's a, just a vast and exploding area of interest in the matter. And I think that as we talk to people, as we get home to our districts, et cetera, they will begin to know more. The media. The media has been running articles, will continue to run articles. I mean, they're on the telephone all the time, wanting to know about this aspect, that, and the other. So I think the public is becoming very educated. And this is a matter of great public debate at this point in time. And we'll continue. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, anytime you get Avon and uh, Liz Claiborne and everybody involved in it, I exactly. think you're moving in the right direction. <laughs> at this time, I yield to Congressman Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, most of the questions have been asked. I just want to congratulate my colleagues for bringing this to our attention. I think it's important that we, members of Congress, also uh, become educated as well. And obviously you're doing a very good job at that. And as the education process continues, I think you'll have more and more members who recognize the shortcoming of the, of the current plan. Uh, and so I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to add this, and I certainly support your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Let me you. thank all three of you thank for your you. testimony. It's been very, very helpful. And I look forward to working with you in terms of shaping the kind of legislation and final analysis that we all would be proud of and that as a result, the people in America will be much healthier. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to call our next panel, Dr. Edward Sandick, please come forward, Dr. Robert Smith, Dr. Richard Green, and Linda Smart Smith. Dr. Sonic is the director of the Division of Cancer Control and Prevention at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, Dr. Smith is senior director of Detection Programs, American Cancer Society. Uh, Dr. Green is a fellow at the American College of, and of course, Linda Smart Smith, an RN, clinical director of Planned Parenthood of New York, Brooklyn. Uh, let me just say that before we get started. And, uh, uh, and I have to say this because I'm a little concerned, NCI, um, who put out your new guidelines, and uh, of course we were informed by the press uh, that you had put out your new guidelines. I'd like to say to you that, uh, you know, this is a committee that has oversight activities, and we've been very involved in this issue for quite some time. 
and uh, for no communication to come to the committee and for you to just sort of put it out, uh, we just found that to be a little strange. And at the same time, we having this hearing here today. So I just want to go on record letting you know in terms of uh, my concerns when things like this happen. So uh, I just want to share that with you uh, before we get started. I would also like to thank all the witnesses for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to be with us today. We will ask each of you to testify and then we will have questions uh, for the panel. In the interest of time, we ask that you summarize your testimony to approximately five minutes so that we will have ample time to ask questions. <coughs> so in order to, just in case you lose track and might not know what five minutes is all about, and I know how these things occur, we will have a light there uh, that will start out green and then when it becomes red, uh, that means your five minutes is up. So uh, we will assist you in terms of helping you to recognize five minutes. Uh, the full context of your written statement uh, will be submitted to the record and will be included in total in the record. Uh, so uh, we just ask that you uh, summarize. So why don't we move forward by first uh, asking you, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, to uh, the Cancer Society to move for, to uh, open up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm grateful for the privilege to be here this afternoon. The American Cancer Society pledges to work with Congress and the President to enact reforms that will best meet the needs of cancer patients and potential cancer patients. And we commend you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting this hearing on women's health aspects of health care reform. The Clinton Plan is at variance with the breast cancer screening guidelines of the American Cancer Society and 10 other national medical organizations insofar as it does not provide for routine mammography for women between the ages of 40 and 49 years and provides only for biennial mammography for women aged 50 to 64, with no mention of clinical breast examination for either age group. The White House has added that screening mammography will be available to women aged 40 to 49 and more frequently than every two years for women aged 50 to 64 if they fall into particular high-risk categories. Let me express our concerns about this element of the plan. We have solid evidence from studies that have included a wide age range of women that routine screening for breast cancer is effective in reducing deaths from this disease. And while a majority of studies suggest a benefit from screening in women aged 40 to 49, in none has this difference achieved statistical significance. However, there is compelling inferential evidence that screening can be as effective in this age group as has been more convincingly demonstrated in women aged 50 years and older. The American Cancer Society and 11 other organizations found these data and data from observational studies to be sufficiently compelling to recommend that women aged 40 to 49 be screened every one to two years with mammography, that women aged 50 years and older be screened annually, and that each group have a clinical breast examination each year. The Clinton Plan proposes to screen women aged 50 and older every two years. While there is some evidence that screening in older women may be done less often, we are not aware that it has been scientifically demonstrated that a biennial interview, interval is equally effective beginning at age 50 compared with a later age, perhaps age 55, when a majority of women are postmenopausal. Mr. Chairman, you and your colleagues have heard and will continue to hear statements that assert that the best or most recent science shows no benefit from mammography in reducing mortality from breast cancer in women aged 40 to 49. The colloquialisms of science can be misleading because as scientists and clinicians, we often speak with great confidence about what we know and do not know, and the use of expressions such as no evidence and no benefit may truly mean something different than what is asserted. We cannot truly speak with that degree of scientific confidence about screening women aged 40 to 49. Those who oppose screening in this age group base their decision more on the absence of clear evidence from randomized clinical trials that screening is effective rather than the presence of clear evidence that it is not. Does the provision for breast cancer screening leave women vulnerable? In some ways, it does. In addition to the general benefits, supporters of this element of the plan have argued that high-risk women for whom it is deemed medically necessary can be screened more frequently. In principle, this is a worthy idea, and for some diseases, it is practical. However, for breast cancer, this strategy is unworkable. Attempts to determine if it is feasible to identify a significant proportion of the population at especially low risk or high risk on the basis of established risk factors and screen these groups accordingly 
have shown that the effort would fail to identify nearly 80 percent of the cases. And with the exception of a small proportion of women who are at a very high risk due to a strong family history, the most important risk factor for the average woman is her age. With respect to screening for cervical and endometrial cancer, the Clinton Plan is in closer agreement with the American Cancer Society guidelines. For guidelines, the basic benefit package provides for a pelvic examination and pap smear every three years before the age of 19 if a woman has reached childbearing age and is at risk for cervical cancer. And a similar provision exists for women between the ages of 20 and 39 after three annual negative smears have been obtained. We would argue that the provision for three consecutive annual negative smears should hold for the initiation of pap testing if before age 20 rather than beginning only after age 20. Further, the American Cancer Society recommends an annual pelvic examination after the age of 40 for the purpose of screening for endometrial cancer with possible benefits for the early detection of ovarian cancer. While screening for cervical cancer reasonably may be performed less frequently than annually, since it is only partially effective in detecting endometrial cancer, our guidelines recommend an annual pelvic examination for women aged 40 and older. Since risk of endometrial cancer may be higher among women on estrogen replacement therapy, the advantage of an annual pelvic examination in this age group is perhaps further reinforced. Mr. Chairman, the past decade has seen an unprecedented increase in the acceptance and utilization of mammography by women in this country. We have also witnessed growing attention to meeting the early detection needs of low-income women and minority populations. The American Cancer Society has been a strong advocate for the Centers for Disease Control's Breast and Cervical Cancer Detection Program and has established a memorandum of understanding as a commitment for the collaboration at the national level and local level. If the basic benefits of this section is not clarified, we have the potential for the very circumstances this plan manifestly intends to rectify a two-tiered system of health care. Our greatest concern is for those women who want this examination but will be unable to obtain it because it is financially prohibitive to them and their families. Several years into the CDC program, having provided this benefit to many poor women, the government is now proposing to withdraw it. Two weeks ago in Geneva, Switzerland, I attended the International Union Against Cancer meeting on breast cancer screening in premenopausal women. Attendees included leading investigators from the major European and North American studies of breast cancer screening, and reports were issued and debated. On the issue of screening women aged 40 to 49 years, the conclusions and recommendations of the workshop were supported by the conference and thus became a concluding document. It concluded that the existing scientific data are inadequate to answer this important question of efficacy of screening younger women, that scientists and women have endured this uncertainty for too long, and the greater costs of this uncertainty are borne by the women who face the risk of breast cancer. The meeting concluded that since the existing trial data have provided compelling insights into the potential to significantly reduce deaths in this age group, a major new study with strong international participation should be initiated. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the American Cancer Society believes that mammography should be available as part of the basic benefit package for women aged 40 to 49 years. We also question the wisdom of initiating biennial screening at the age of 50 rather than age 55 or 60. While we fully endorse an approach to health care that is cost effective, we believe the data are sufficiently compelling that mammography is beneficial for women aged 40 to 49. And we hope that the administration would include screening for this age group as part of the basic benefit package and support carefully designed studies that have the potential to provide sound scientific evidence about early breast cancer detection in this age group. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, forgive me for going over. Thank you for, again for this opportunity, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith. Dr. Sondick. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am Dr. Edward Sondick, Deputy Director for the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control at the National Cancer Institute. With me today are Dr. Karen Johnson from the Early Detection and Community Oncology Program and Dr. Ruth Ann Justy from the Division of Cancer Treatment. We thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the NCI's current screening guidelines for breast and cervical cancers, two areas critical to women's health. Uh, and before I continue, I would like to address your comment uh, first. It was news to me, as it was to you, that we have changed our guidelines. We certainly have not changed our guidelines, and as I will discuss in our testimony, uh, we are 
we we are considering whether or not those guidelines should be changed on the basis of the current scientific evidence uh, there is a set of draft guidelines which has been widely circulated to the american cancer society to other organizations uh, as well as to it turns out the news media but those are draft and in fact a meeting will take place a week from yesterday on october twenty first of one of our scientific boards that will re review these draft guidelines and give us guidance as to our future directions so to set the record straight if i we could we have not changed our guidelines at, at this point um, i will uh, in the interest of the five minute rule uh, not review the magnitude of the problem. Many have covered that, and, and it certainly is important. But I would want to focus just briefly on the disproportionate burden of this disease among minority and underserved, uh, uh, underserved women. Both diseases, I might point out. Uh, survival is much lower among African American women's, uh, women f uh, in, uh, for breast cancer, and the incidence and mortality of cervical cancer among that population group are two to three times as high as among the white women. So it's most certainly a very serious problem in its disproportionate burden. I'd like to provide, if, if I could, some information more specific to how we develop guidelines. In 1987, the NCI participated with the American Cancer Society and other organizations to develop working guidelines for the early detection of cervical and breast cancers. These guidelines provided the American public with a summary of the state of knowledge at that time. And as guidelines, they most certainly will change over time as we learn more about uh, uh, these diseases and uh, the efficacy of early detection. Screening mammography guidelines for breast cancer detection, which can be defined as a regularly performed mammogram for a woman with no presumptive evidence of breast cancer, that is, no signs or symptoms of the disease, are as follows. And these are our current guidelines. The screening process should begin by age 40 and consist of annual breast clinical examination with screening mammography performed at one to two year intervals. Beginning at age 50, both clinical breast exam and mammography should be performed on an annual basis. Basis. Physicians, in addition, should encourage women to perform monthly breast self-examinations. For cervical cancer, the guidelines we developed in 1987 in concert with the other organizations in, in, include the following. All women who are or who have been sexually active or who have reached the age of 18 years should have an annual pep te pap test and pelvic examination. After a woman has had three or more consecutive satisfactory normal annual examinations, the pap test may be performed less frequently at the discretion of her physician. Over the ensuing six years, there has been no in new information to contradict the original guidelines on cervical cancer. However, over the last two years, several events have led to an ongoing reevaluation of the breast cancer screening guidelines. First, in April of 1992, we held a, a forum focused on, on cancer, breast cancer screening in older women. Among the conclusions of that meeting was a general endorsement of screening older women, uh, along with the note that it is necessary to weigh the relative benefits of comorbidity and screening effectiveness for the individual patient in this age group. That group, that forum, also uh, addressed the interval for mammography and clinical breast exam and concluded that there was no evidence to choose one interval over another since apparently equally effective intervals have ranged from 12 to 33 months. Secondly, uh, there was the, uh, the publication of the Canadian National Breast Cancer Screening Study, particularly that portion of the study that focused on women in their 40s. That uh, publication, which occurred in November of 1992, did not show a mortality benefit after seven years of follow-up. Third, an overview analysis of five randomized screening trials conducted in Sweden in the 1970s was reported early in 1993. The study found that the largest reduction of breast cancer mortality, 29 percent, was, was observed among women aged 50 to 69 at randomization. Among women aged 40 to 49 at randomization, a 13% reduction was found, a result that was not statistically significant. Also, there was an overview analysis of these trials that was presented at a major meeting we held last February, a major scientific meeting that reviewed all eight randomized intervention trials for breast cancer, uh, all that exist up to this point. That meeting concluded the following. 
For women ages 50 to 69, the evidence presented strengthens the scientific observation that screening leads to reduced breast cancer mortality. Every study presented found a protective effect for women in this age group. Secondly, the randomized trials of women aged 40 to 49 are consistent in showing no statistically significant benefit in mortality after 10 to 12 years of follow-up. It is clear that in the first five to seven years, there is no reduction in mortality from breast cancer that can be attributed to screening. There is an uncertain and, if present, marginal reduction in mortality at about 10 to 12 years. Only one study provides information on long-term effects beyond 12 years, and more information is needed. We have taken the results of the, the workshop and, uh, and have circulated it widely in the scientific community. In fact, it was just published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. The results have been reviewed by our NCI PDQ editorial board consisting of both NCI, NIH, and non-NIH researchers. And the results have also been reviewed by a variety of, uh, of organizations. We will focus on these, uh, on the results of that workshop and a set of draft guidelines we have prepared at the upcoming October 21st meeting of the NCI DCPC, Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, Board of Scientific Counselors. We expect that by de December 1st, we will have reviewed the guidance from that scientific group and others and be in a position to determine whether or not we wish to revise our, our breast cancer screening guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would be very pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sondick. Uh, Ms. Smart Smith. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Smart Smith, and I am the director of Planned Parenthood of New York City's Reproductive Health Care Clinic in Brooklyn. Thank you for inviting me here today to talk about the importance of regular, preventive, reproductive health care specifically annual pap smears. Planned Parenthood of New York City is New York's oldest provider of reproductive health care. For 77 years, we have been working hard to help New Yorkers of all ages and incomes get the information and services they need to make responsible and deliberate choices about their sexual and reproductive lives. Last year, we provided 60,000 New Yorkers with the full range of reproductive health care services, including confidential contraceptive and abortion services, prenatal care, AIDS testing and case management, STD screening, and annual gynecological exams. We reached thousands more with our outreach and education programs. I am here before you today as a service provider to tell you about the women I see every day. Rates of sexually transmitted diseases are up across the nation, but in New York City, always the trendsetters, we're seeing an epidemic. And AIDS is the leading cause of death for women aged 25 to 44 in New York City. Because the population we serve is at such high risk for AIDS and sexually transmitted diseases, we need once a year pap tests in order to step in with early treatment and advice that saves lives. The pap smear is one of our most effective preventive tools. Not only is it a way to detect full-blown cervical cancer, but we use it to detect the human papillomavirus, which can lead to cervical cancer, and we can also use it to detect vaginal infections and herpes. The annual pap test exam is also an opportunity for us to talk to our clients about protecting themselves from STDs and AIDS. We go over the risk factors they have in their lives and help them find ways to reduce these risks. It is not unusual for us to see a woman who, one year after a normal pap smear result, comes back to us for her annual exam with cervical dysplasia, a precursor to cervical cancer. What happened in that year? Maybe she's contracted the human papillomavirus and doesn't know it. Or maybe she's been HIV positive for five years without knowing it, and all of a sudden, AIDS is starting to manifest itself in irregular growth on her cervix. 
Whatever the cause, she needs immediate attention. She needs an immediate colposcopy and probably a cervical biopsy, laser surgery, or cryotherapy. This woman definitely could not have waited another two years for her next pap smear. In three years, her condition could have gotten so severe that she would require immediate hospitalization. Another reason we have clients come in once a year is to catch false negatives. Good as it is, the pap test is not 100% accurate, not by a long shot. It's a screening test. I would hate to see a woman who had gotten a false negative on her test wait another three years before discovering the mistake. If our new health care plan only allows for a pap smear every three years, a woman could hypothetically have cervical cancer for six years before it's detected. She may not live that long. Cervical cancer kills 10,000 women a year, and it is completely treatable, the only treatable cancer. Cervical dysplasia and early cervical cancer can be easily and inexpensively treated in a doctor's office. Full-blown cervical cancer can require hysterectomy and a hospital stay. <coughs> and if left undetected for too long, it means death. Annual pap smears are an integral part of good preventive health care for women of all ages, particularly during their years of sexual activity. I would add, in response to your earlier comments, um, Mr. Towns, that women do not, at the stroke of their 65th birthday, <laughs> automatically stop being sexually active beings. As with men, we continue our sexual lives until the day we die. <coughs> and I would submit that stopping pap smears at age 65 is again taking women from entrance into the 20th and 21st centuries and taking us back to places that we never want to see again, the dark ages. As women, we have the same feelings and needs as men, and pap smears can save our lives. And I would also suggest that in large urban centers, such as New York City, we're seeing young women who are becoming sexually active more and more early in their lives. And instead of looking at 18 as a time when some women become sexually active, you need to look at the reality of what is going on today and begin to save the lives of our young women and mature women. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Smith. Let me just pause at this point and to uh, uh, interrupt it because my colleague has a conflict, and so I would like to just sort of yield to Congressman Schiff and then to Congressman Portman before going back to the witnesses. No, Congressman I, I, Schiff. I appreciate that, but would like to hear, appreciate that courtesy uh, because we both have matters planned before this hearing was uh, brought up, but would like to hear Dr. Green's testimony. And before uh, yielding. If, 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 if I may. Thank you. Sure. Dr. Green. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I am Richard P. Green, a practicing obstetrician gynecologist here in the District of Columbia. I am testifying on behalf of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, an organization representing more than 33,000 physicians providing women's health care. As a primary care physician, I see firsthand the effects that lack of access to health care has on the lives of women. One of the most disturbing experiences as a physician is to treat a woman suffering from a devastating or debilitating health condition and to know that if I had seen her sooner, I could have prevented or reduced her suffering. For this reason, I must begin my testimony by commending the President and the First Lady for presenting the nation with a plan that will guarantee American women access to health care on a regular basis. This is a major step forward. As a practicing OBGYN for 20 years, I believe that early detection of cancer is, a, is the single most effective way to improve the survival rate in patients with cervical and breast cancer. I am here today because I am concerned that the frequency of coverage for pap smears, general medical exams, including pelvic exams, and mammograms is not adequate under the American Health Security Act. I am also disturbed that there is no physician discretion for more frequent cancer screening of women who may be at an increased risk for cervical or breast cancer and for women whose medical condition may warrant more frequent cancer screening. 
As a primary care physician, I have a responsibility to advocate the best care possible for my patients. I, like most OBGYNs, recommend an annual pap smear and pelvic exam for all of my patients. When preparing for this testimony, I could not remember a patient of mine who had invasive cervical cancer. I believe seeing my patients annually is the major reason, since I catch the problems before cancer develops. However, in discussing the issue with one of my colleagues, I heard a very troubling story. A colleague of mine had a patient for whom he had provided medical care and health screening for a number of years. After a number of consecutive annual examinations, including pap smears that were normal, the patient left the area. Since she had had a series of normal pap smears and no known risk factors, her new physician felt comfortable extending the length of time between these evaluations. When she returned to my colleague's city and again came to his office, it had been just over two years since her last pap smear. The pap exam on that visit was remarkably abnormal and ultimately led to a diagnosis of cervical cancer. Fortunately, following appropriate therapy, this woman is alive and well. However, it is likely that early detection would have decreased the probability of her receiving a hysterectomy and radiation therapy. Unfortunate situations like this compel me and my colleagues to argue for more frequent cancer screenings than those of the President's plan. Turning to mammography. In ACOG's view, the American Health Security Act's coverage is inadequate. Women over the age of 50 should have mammograms annually. Clinical breast exams should be done by the physician annually. Of course, self-breast exams should be done by the patient each month. As a sole physician for many of my patients, I provide them with all of their preventive health care services and counseling on many issues. Under the American Health Security Act, patients who have seen me once a year for the past 20 years will only be allowed to see me six times in the next 20 years. We would, in effect, become strangers. I believe that the health of many of my patients will be drastically affected by such limited access to preventive care. In closing, as Congress deliberates on health care reform, I would implore you to make the health concerns of women your priority, rather than the economic benefits derived by limited access to care. If you don't, it is the women of this country who will suffer gravely as their access to providers and medical care is curtailed. We taxpayers pay for an annual physical examination for our president, and I believe that American women should receive no less. Thank you very much. Just before I yield to um, uh, Congressman Schiff, uh, I would just like to point out to uh, the members uh, that we have requested NCI to talk about their guidelines and the science behind them and not about the health plan. Uh, I would like the members to keep that in mind when they raise questions because that was something that we talked to them about before coming here today. So uh, at, with that in mind, I yield now to Congressman Schiff. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for yielding to me. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I, I have no specific questions for the witnesses. I've appreciated their testimony. I've appreciated their obvious many years of expertise in, in this area. I cannot help, however, uh, just bringing up again the context in which we are having this discussion. We are having a discussion of what are the appropriate medical standards, in this case for, for, for tests for women's health care, in the context of a, uh, an initial proposal from the administration that the government is going to tell women what their health care is going to be. Uh, that is, the administration's proposal is that uh, uh, state governments will run regional alliances under the uh, supervision of a brand new federal bureaucracy known as the National Health Board. And uh, I'm not a knee-jerk supporter of the way we do things now. I thought that the President, in his address to the country, rightfully brought up some problems that very, very well do exist today in our health care delivery system in many different ways. But I just want to say that I, I'm not sure that the direction we are now going in is going to really make an improvement, may in fact be, uh, uh, be adverse to where we are now. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Right. Congressman Portman. Congressman Payne. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, apologize for being late and uh, <coughs> the conflict that I had, and sorry uh, that I was unable to hear our colleagues on the first panel. The, uh, I uh, would ask unanimous consent to have an opening statement placed in the record. 
Without objection, so moved. Uh, let me see, uh, Dr. Uh, Skolnick, uh, in your professional opinion, how often should women receive mammogram screening in order to detect breast cancer at its earliest and treatable stages? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, our current guidelines uh, are every one to two years for women in their 40s, and then annually thereafter for women in their 50s and beyond. Okay. Are there any other physicians that would have any different? Oh, we have no other. Dr. Green, you agree with that? I would agree with that, sir, assuming that the mammogram was normal. If it was normal, then one to two years in the 40 to 49 bracket, and if it was normal annually from 50, age 50 on. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, gentleman yield just a certainly, second. Mr. Chairman. If there is a history in the family, say, if, uh, wherein this has occurred, you know, over and over again, would that put a person on a special watch? It would indeed. Uh, Breast cancer does seem to show up in families. If you had a normal mammogram, I think depending on the age of the patient, you probably could go, let's use the 40 to 49 bracket. If I had a known history in the family of breast cancer, then I don't think I would encourage that patient to go to the every two year interval. I would probably be inclined to start her mammograms on an annual basis starting at age 40. There may come a time when it might have to be repeated at six months. What you're look, looking for here is the individual factor of how to maintain the patient's best health and well-being. So there's a broad general category that we try to put everybody in, but then certain specific situations, such as the one you have uh, expanded on, would require special attention. Are you back? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Smart-Smith. Um, uh, can you describe uh, for me the population that is uh, at risk, uh, highest at risk anyway, for a cervical cancer, in your opinion? What I can describe to you are the patients that come into my clinic center. Uh, we see 22,000 uh, patients a year at my center alone in Brooklyn. And what we're talking about here are numerous young women uh, I would say between the ages of 12 and 18, using that as the cutoff point, um, who come in with abnormal pap smears. We then see women of all ages, but when we're looking at adolescent young women, one of the most important things that we can do for them is have that annual pap smear to begin to detect changes in um, their pap smears. And one thing we're finding more and more for women of all ages, but particularly young adolescent females, is the fact that they are now having many, many uh, abnormal pap smears. For instance, uh, I did a very small um, uh, statistical uh, finding about, oh, six months ago, and out of 800 pap smears in one month, we had 400 abnormal pap smears for mm. women that came into us. Mm. What, uh, what's the approximate charge of a pap smear in your agency? Well, at my agency, the pap smear is included in the uh, visit fee. Um, and I would say if you had it by itself, it would run about 15 to $20. Okay. Uh, and just finally on this, uh, what, what, what are the kind of recognized practices for uh, education and prevention, you know, once you discover, you know, a problem or even prior to a problem, do you do prevention discussions when in your holistic approach? I'm really pleased to talk to you about that. At uh, Planned Parenthood of New York City, one of our very unique services is that every time a woman comes in, particularly uh, younger women and uh, women that are coming in for their initial exams and annual exams, they have counseling. In this counseling piece, they go over all the preventive methods and measures for our patients. In addition to that, if someone has an abnormal pap smear, we morally and ethically follow up that person and make every attempt to get them back in for a consultation visit where we explain to them what the result of the pap smear is and what it means to them, what protective measures they need to take, and what needs to happen next. 
usually a colposcopy. We also have an education and outreach department on site that goes out into the communities to do case finding and to give this information to women who may not be coming into us. Okay, thank you very much. Just finally, um, perhaps I could ask, uh, was it Dr. Sondik? Sondik. Yeah. Sondik. Um, a year or so ago, we had a pretty um, thorough hearing, maybe six months ago, uh, on this uh, tramoxifen business. At that time, it was felt that uh, women were not properly counseled in many of the clinical trials about the downsides. As you know, there were 28,000 women that were going to be a part of the uh, particular study. I know it was uh, the, uh, and, and that the 50% uh, would be given the, uh, the medication. But there was some concern that these healthy women who would be participating in the clinical trials uh, in the haste to move it along and perhaps not having a uniform system throughout the various clinics that were doing this, that uh, in many cases it was discovered that women were not uh, properly counseled as to the fact that um, Tramoxifen could possibly uh, cause, uh, as a matter of fact, cervical cancer or blindness and other potentials that were not brought forth. Uh, what type of follow-up has the uh, NCI done, uh, and have you monitored this um, since the hearing? Because prior to the hearing and prior to our investigation, there was very little uh, monitoring done uh, by NCI. Yeah, I'd be pleased to respond to that. Uh, the, you're, you're referring to the tamoxifen trial, which, which will enroll right. about uh, 16,000 uh, uh, women in total. Right. Um, actually, I'm very pleased to say the recruitment for that is coming along extremely well. And uh, there's great interest in the, uh, in the scientific and the public community for participating in that. Uh, in response to uh, your concerns and others, we reviewed all of our procedures regarding informed consent and all of the materials. They were all brought in. This is a very large trial being conducted at hundred, literally hundreds of sites around the country. We reviewed all of the material concerned with informed consent, how this material was being disseminated, and um, uh, made sure that it was standardized uh, so that it made the specific points that needed to be considered the points that, uh, that uh, the community was concerned about. Um, it's very important in any trial like this that women be uh, uh, completely apprised of any potential side effects that might occur. And I might even say especially so in a prevention trial. Mm -hmm. And even more so in this one, which is really the first large-scale prevention trial. Uh, we um, have been monitoring the, uh, the sites to be sure that um, the um, information is uh, passed along and uh, are currently very pleased with, uh, with our progress uh, so far. I think the, um, the response of the, uh, of the community to this, both the scientific and the public to it, I think is one testimony to uh, the effectiveness of these procedures so far. Okay, thank you. It looked like my time has expired, but Mr. Chairman, if you would uh, just indulge one quick uh, final question. Uh, at the time, we found that there were, uh, in the uh, clinical trials uh, that were, um, uh, at that time, there were, um, the minority participation was lacking. There were not, um, uh, seemed like, an, uh, an approach or an outreach to uh, women in minority communities. Uh, offhand, would you know whether that has been expanded and uh, whether this, this sampling will take in uh, the total face of, of America and not just those that are um, highly motivated or, or are, are healthier and, and, and aware of, you know, health is something that even with national health insurance, um, uh, different people have different levels of knowledge about prevention and wellness and so forth. Has there been an increase in the number of minorities? 
or what have you done to attempt to do that? Well, this is, a, this is an, an issue not only for this particular trial, but for all studies underway at, at NIH. And there's been a considerable focus of the leadership of NIH on how to achieve this type of uh, a widespread uh, recruitment. Um, we, uh, all of the investigators in this study it submitted plans for this recruitment. Um, in, again, in response to the, the raising these questions, these plans have been reviewed and um, uh, we have worked with our Office of Cancer Communications and others on strategies for communicating the, the trial, notice about the trial, uh, the implications of it, the potential benefits of it, potential costs of it, if you will, to, to these, these communities. I don't have figures with me today on uh, minority participation, but I would be happy to supply those for, to you for the record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much, um, um, Congressman Payne. Uh, let me just sort of uh, uh, go, first of all, that the PAP test costs approximately $15 in $20, yeah. <clears throat> and that all the things that you can detect with it in terms of uh, uh, herpes and uh, vaginal infections and, uh, and all the kind of things, HIV, I mean, you can detect all these things, and, uh, and to limit it, you know, uh, I find that to be very disturbing because uh, I don't think that anyone sitting here in the Congress or sitting any place or the White House or anywhere uh, can determine in terms of what really should happen in a local clinic. I think that uh, uh, I become very concerned, you know, when we try and legislate that, you know, rather than to take it out of the hands of the medical profession uh, and that nurse that sees that patient or that doctor that sees that patient. You know, when I know in terms of all the kind of things that uh, can be detected, you know, by you just sort of being there and seeing, and the fact that we're not talking about something that, that expensive. The other thing, I guess, Dr. Green, I want to sort of raise with you, uh, your patients that over 65, you know, um, when they come in, uh, uh, do you uh, test them for cervical cancer, those that might be 65 or over? I most certainly do. Um, as has been stated by a uh, previous speaker, the patients, at least the patients that I have, don't end their um, sexual activity because they've achieved a certain point in life. And as long as the patients are still sexually active, uh, there's no reason that one should stop doing pap smears simply because they've <coughs> achieved a numerical number. Uh, 65 should, in my opinion, receive pap smears on an annual basis. My patients do. Yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that because uh, it indicates that uh, currently, well, actually, uh, the highest incident and the highest mortality rates for cervical cancer occur in women over 65. Uh, currently, 14% of the United States female population that is 65 or more years of age account for 25% of the new cases of cervical cancer and 41% of the deaths from the, this disease. And to talk about limiting it, to me, just seems to be, if they say in my neighborhood back in Brooklyn, Ms. Smart, this is hustling backwards. Mr. Chairman, if I might add, um the average lifespan for American women now is fast approaching 80. I think it's about 60, 78 years, some months. And if you're going to have a lady who has 15, by statistics, 15 good years left, and you're going to tell her, in essence, we're not going to do any evaluation of you during these last 15 years, it, it just doesn't make any sense. One other point, if we have patients that are being evaluated every three years, one major point that we're missing out on that's extremely important is the pelvic examination. If you don't see a patient for three years to do the pap smear, then you can't do a pelvic examination. In my opinion, the pelvic is the most fascinating area of the body, maybe save for the brain. This is the reproductive area. You can know how to evaluate and look for cancer of the fallopian tube, cancer of the ovary. You check the bladder, which is part of the urinary system. You check the rectum, which is part of the gastrointestinal system. When you do a pelvic examination, you're evaluating a large segment of that lady's uh, anatomy. And to have someone not show up for a pelvic examination for three years is just going to uh, encourage problems. I would just like to uh, agree with Dr. Green on that point. The pelvic exam, in addition to the pap smear, is an extremely important uh, 
annual exam that should take place. You do so much case finding and you find so many problems coming out of that that if you let a woman go for three years without having that opportunity, uh, instead of continuing to expand that lifespan for a woman, you're going to find a way to decrease that lifespan. It is so important. It's almost impossible to explain the importance of that. Let me thank all of you for your uh, testimony and to say to you that uh, I do have uh, some concerns. I think you touched upon it, uh, Ms. Smith, in terms of an epidemic that occurs in certain areas. And uh, I could see in terms of certain epidemics that would, would occur that we might not be able to address if we do not create a little more flexibility in this plan. And coming from an area that has, you know, uh, several epidemics, uh, number one, uh, AIDS and, of course, uh, tuberculosis, and uh, I could go on and on. Uh, that uh, a plan that does not give some flexibility to allow an area to be able to address that, you know, uh, it becomes very disturbing to me. And that when I look at some of the other things that uh, I feel that uh, uh, should be covered in a plan with the fact that the, the medical staff should have the kind of flexibility to be able to deal with it uh, and, and not to have to sit back and to say whether or not if I do this, will uh, we be paid for it. Uh, to me, uh, that's not true health care reform in the sense that I like to see it. And I think that, you know, when we talk about health care reform, that we hope that when we finish that the product will be better than what we have now. Uh, but I'm moving very cautiously because, uh, as my father said, you know, so many times, is it that uh, I guess I have to look at health care reform in the same sense we look at prayer. You know, uh, uh, prayer... Uh, is neither positive or negative. It depends on what happens when the person opens his or her mouth. If they pray that you break your neck, that's negative. And if they pray that you live a long life, uh, so uh, uh, this reform, we have to be careful because it's uh, something that we have to watch as it moves because here again, I think it falls into that category. It, the final product will determine whether or not it's the kind of reform that I would like to see. So thank you very much. And let me yield now at this time to uh, Congressman Portman from Ohio. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, following along those lines of the sort of the outlines of the health plan, I have a couple of general questions. Uh, the first really for NCI and uh, Dr. Sodnik. Uh, I assume that uh, you and your organization were very involved in the development of the health care task force proposal. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. So no. your screening guidelines, uh, uh, to your knowledge, really have, while they may have been used, uh, in the development of the proposal, you haven't testified before the task force or been involved let, let, let in me, There are me, just, let me go on record saying that, you know, we have an agreement, you know, uh, that uh, they're not here to talk about the right. plan itself. Right. And uh, we have sort of agreed upon that before they arrive. So uh, uh, I would like to sort of hold to my agreement because, uh, you know, uh, 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 as we go along, that I'm certain that, uh, you know, uh, we will have some questions, but the point is that they're not prepared to deal with those questions on this right. hearing today, so Mr. Right. Portman. So I will certainly, I, I certainly, certainly respect that, but I, I, I was uh, trying to be respectful of the Chairman's earlier statements. I was mostly concerned to know whether your screening guidelines uh, <coughs> had been used as a basis for the recommendations or not, and we can defer that until later. And then more importantly, I suppose, if in fact six days from now you're changing your guidelines, if that were to happen, um, and if in fact we don't receive a proposal for uh, some period of time, maybe uh, two or three weeks, the question arises as to whether the proposal might in fact be changed and whether we might see some changes that would uh, uh, perhaps change the views of the participants on this panel and our earlier panel as to the task force proposal itself. Well, I'm not sure since, since I personally did not participate in, in the development of uh, at least, in, well, actually in any portion of, uh, of the plan that you've uh, seen. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that information came from, but let me say that there are a, a number of different guidelines that exist. There's one set that we in the American Cancer Society and uh, ACOG and others all subscribe to. Uh, there's another set that was produced by the Preventive Services Task Force. There are no doubt other, other uh, recommendations that one can find. Uh, I think that uh, uh, reasonable scientists uh, can arrive at uh, different, reasonable but different conclusions looking at the same data. And that may be one aspect of having these different uh, uh, recommendations. I don't believe that at our meeting next week um, we will 
uh, change our guidelines. We're asking this scientific group for, for guidance, and then we will consider that, and I would expect within perhaps the next several weeks after that, decide whether uh, uh, we should change our guidelines, and if so, to, uh, to what. Thank you very much. It'll be timely, I think, in any case, because I imagine we'll be talking about these issues for, for a number of months. A more general question to move off of the, of the President's uh, proposal in, in NCI, uh, and that has to do with research. Uh, Dr. Smith, you spoke about the need perhaps for some additional studies to be done in order to come up with better guidelines. Uh, the previous panel talked about research and the necessity for more research in the area of women's health generally. Could uh, you, Dr. Smith, or perhaps uh, Ms. Smith, other panelists, comment on from you, what you know of it, what you think about the provisions in the task force plan to fund research, to, to, to fund additional trials, to fund the, the, the kind of research that uh, I think has probably made this country number one in, in that area, uh, despite some of the, uh, the problems that have been discussed today. Dr. Smith. I think the provision to fund additional research is an important one. You know, on this particular issue of screening women aged 40 to 49, as, as Dr. Sondek mentioned, uh, reasonable scientists can even agree on the data and draw different conclusions about practice from it. Uh, yet there still remains a number of very important uh, issues, and I, and I think many of which would have clear implications for cost benefit that could be addressed if additional funding and adequate funding to, to support large-scale studies were conducted. I think it's also especially important that these have broad participation. So the different groups that, that uh, want to issue recommendations and want to make and establish guidelines for their constituents uh, can, can reach you know, reasonable consensus about the outcomes of these studies if they, if they share in their planning and their operation. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is especially true for women aged 40 to 49. I'm not uh, well versed in the terms of the plan as far yeah. as research. However, research plays a very important role in just about every area of health care. If you don't integrate that to the reality of people's lives, then it's worthless. So if there is research included in the plan, it must be linked to what is actually going on in the lives of the women across this nation, whether it's a large urban center or a smaller rural area. I think you will find some similarities, and it must be linked and integrated. It must be linked and integrated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go back. Thank you. Uh, just before he has a minute left on his time, I want to use it. Uh, uh, Dr. Green, I guess on you too, Mr. Smith, I really want to, uh, because this has bothered me, yeah, how should the physician's discretion or the nurse's discretion be incorporated in this plan? How can we do that? Well, <clears throat> the way it uh, is recommended now, um, if you have three normal pap smears, then the person doesn't need to come back for another three years at the physician's discretion. The, the problem that I have with that is the decision that the physician makes may not be with all of the knowledge or facts available. L let me give you a brief example. If a patient comes to see you and you inquire about her prior sexual history, usually the, the, the true data comes out once the patient develops a rapport with you, once she feels comfortable with you. And this may take several office visits or even several years. Everyone who comes to you for the first time and they don't know you is going to be monogamous, or at least they're going to be monogamous when you ask the question. So when you are making a decision about whether you're going to allow this person to go away for three years and the data before you says this is a monogamous lady, at least the data says that according to the question that you've asked her, and now she has three pap smears, when in fact she may have been a lady that may have been more than monogamous but not able to give you that information at that visit because the doctor-patient relationship hadn't developed that closeness. If you do develop that closeness and then you don't see her for another three years, then you're going to be strangers when she comes back to visit you again. So I think the doctor's discretion plays a very important role, but the doctor's discretion is, might not be based on factual data. It'll be based on what he has been able to acquire from the patient, but it may or may not be accurate. Smith? I uh, 
certainly agree with Dr. Green. It's not always what someone says to you where you find the truth of the matter. Um, I think the doctor and the nurse are very important in determining the frequency of the need for the annual visit or whatever uh, visit we have here. Three years is outrageous. Uh, Dr. Green, in his anecdote about his colleague, described a case that happens frequently. Women who may have other priorities because of where they happen to be in life at that particular time may not see health care as a major, of major importance. They might happen to come in and they may not come back for two years or three years, just as the plan would like it to happen. And when they come back, they have got cancer. We've got to avoid that. We've got to at least make it possible for them to come in and have that pelvic exam, that pap smear, every year so that if there are changes going on, we can detect it. Also, women may be monogamous, but we don't know about their partners. We have got to live in the real world of 1993 and see what is actually happening there, not what we would like it to be. We cannot insert our values on the women that we see. We have to just be in tune to what's actually going on and give women the benefit of good quality health care. That means bringing them back every year for a pap smear pelvic exam, not every three years, because someone's value says that's when it should be. This is what we're seeing. This is what we do. Let me thank all of you for your testimony. And uh, uh, yes, just if you need up for one quick last question to uh, Dr. Sondek, uh, has uh, let me just ask: Has NCI received any new evidence regarding the efficacy of mammograms that have led them to revise their breath, uh, breast cancer screening guidelines? Uh, yes, we've we certainly have received the additional evidence. Uh, beyond that that we had in 1987. Uh, we have the Canadian trial, actually two trials that uh, concluded. We have additional data from the Swedish trials. Uh, we have additional analysis of all of this that has taken place, including a meta-analysis, a combining of all of the, all of the trials that was done by uh, investigators in New, in New Zealand. We had a summary of the uh, Swedish trials that uh, was presented. And um, in essence, we're getting new data all the time. In fact, at the meeting that was just held in Geneva that Dr. Smith mentioned, there was additional data that was presented even beyond that which we had in February. Well, let, let me just ask you this. I'm talking about American women. Uh, you've talked about the Swedish. You mentioned the Canadian. You've got New Zealand in there. You're in Geneva. What about here in the United States of America, in New York City, and in New Orleans, and in Omaha, Nebraska. What, what, did you get any data on that? We've had uh, uh, continuing follow-up of the Health Insurance Plan of New York study, but it hasn't provided any new information other than that which we'd seen at about the 14-year follow-up. But it is interesting that we're now starting to get information that I think will be very useful to understanding the operation of the, if I can call it, mammography screening system, if you will. Uh, we now have uh, cancer registries that are reviewing the operation of screening uh, in their areas that are giving us data on uh, uh, the effectiveness of this in terms of the number of cancers that are being detected in terms of the number of procedures per cancer detected. So in a sense, they're giving us operational types of information that can be used to try to improve the system. But in terms of your basic question, have we learned anything about the role of mammography in reducing the mortality in American women from a study that was conducted in this country? No, we haven't since the Health Insurance Plan of New York study. All right. That's what I would like to hear something about what's happening here. You know, when you downgrade something, when you say, well, you don't need to do it every year, every three years will do, or every other year is not necessary anymore, let's do it every five years, there should be some, some real empirical data, some very hard data to determine that you need to lessen 
the screening, the surveillance, uh, in any kind of uh, society, or in, 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 in police work, if there's less crime in an area, then you reduce the number of police. If you don't have a lessening of crime, as a matter of fact, if you have an increase, you certainly wouldn't lessen the number of police. I mean, so it appears to me that we still have a, very, a continued, continuing problem that's even perhaps escalating and we're talking about lessening the surveillance and it just just I'm not a physician so that's probably why I don't understand it but just trying to use common sense it just seems to be going um, they hustle backwards in Newark too. <laughs> yeah. there, there is one concern that has come up since this February meeting which I think is, is very important uh, it's become clearer and clearer that the amount of information that's available is really way too little for the concerns in this, uh, of this problem. Uh, it's not clear, uh, we believe, to American women and to many of their physicians, for that matter, um, uh, how precise the mammography is, how often it will find a cancer in women under 40, over 40, above 50, and so forth. How many procedures are going to be necessary to resolve that cancer and understand whether in fact, or that abnormal reading, and find out whether or not it's a true cancer and so forth. So that it, the, when one screens more frequently, there are, there are harms, if you will, potential harms that go along with that, just as there are potential benefits. And arriving at a particular operating point, if you will, whether it's every year, every two years, every three years, is a matter of, in some sense, balancing that. And in bringing that up, I'm not talking about cost, period. I'm simply talking about the kinds of things that, that can happen. Um, it's uh, from one recent study, we can see that on the admission, on, on administering any mammogram, the chances of an abnormal reading regardless of whether or not the woman has a problem. In fact, if the woman does not have a problem, the chances are about six out of 100. Now, if one does that continuously, year after year after year, and the woman has no problem, the chances are, just from a statistical basis, that in fact an abnormal reading will occur, which will then have to be checked out. One needs to balance that kind of thing against the mortality reduction. Hey, thank you, man. Time has expired. Right. Let, me, let me just ask you, Dr. Smith, American Cancer Society, I'd like to, for you to answer the same question. We'd like to hear you. <laughs> I'd like to hear you on that issue. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure I exactly remember what the question was, but I do have a few comments on the importance of new data. You know, it was very interesting. Um, Dr. Sonic and I have been colleagues for many years, so we were frequently at the same meetings. And I, I would imagine he joins me in the frustration that we've felt coming together to evaluate the latest updates of very old data, uh, most of which had inadequate sample sizes and most of which there is general uh, a range of agreements or disagreement as to how well the study was conducted. And I think one of the things that we accomplished at this meeting in Geneva, again, reviewing a wide range of data from around the world, was a general consensus that there's not a much great deal to be gained in terms of the ultimate answer to this question about efficacy in younger women from continued evaluation of these older studies. And that the question was really too important to rely only on them, and that's why the newer studies were needed. Uh, Dr. Sonic is correct about the, the, the balance of good and harm. But, you know, I think we've made great, great progress in the last uh, ten decade and certainly since the later 1980s in improving the quality of mammography, more and more radiologists are becoming trained in mammography, we can ultimately continue to work to lower false positive rates, uh, work very diligently to minimize the likelihood that a woman without breast cancer or signs of breast cancer could have a biopsy. I think these are all important elements of a, of a strong comprehensive health plan and program for women. And that's the kind of thing, I guess, with research funds, we could better dedicate our efforts to. Thank you very much. Let me thank all the members, all the witnesses, for your testimony. Uh, we really appreciate the time that you uh, shared with us. And also to say to you that we look forward to working very closely with many of you in terms of making certain that we have the best possible health plan for the nation. Thank you very much for your time.
I would like to call on our third panel of witnesses, uh, Cynthia Pearson, Program Director of the National Women's Health Network, Cynthia Newbill, Executive Director of the National Black Women's Health Project, Deborah L. Ness, Executive Vice President of the Women's Legal Defense Fund, Zor Brown, Breast Cancer Resource Committee, and Helene Zentak, Board Member of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Why don't we begin with you, Ms. Pearson? Thank you. I'm representing the National Women's Health Network, which is an advocacy and membership group that is concerned with the health of all women. Currently, as you know, you heard already this afternoon, health is influenced by enormous racial and economic discrepancies. We share with you, Mr. Towns, and the other members of the committee a concern for the impact on, uh, on women of the proposed health reform. There are two basic questions that we have. How will this health reform package affect the health of women who currently have access to health care right now? And number two, how will this health care reform proposal affect the health of women who currently don't have access right now? As we read the plan in its draft form, the Guaranteed National Benefits Package will improve the health of both groups of women overall. First, obviously, women who don't have access now will have access. They will have access to preventive care that they don't have access to now. It will be free based on the schedule we've seen proposed. And they will have access to primary care doctors who provide preventive services instead of getting their health care needs met at the emergency room. And the women who currently have access now will be guaranteed a continuation of that access. They won't be vulnerable like we are now to loss of health care coverage because of death of a husband, divorce, um, changing jobs, losing a job, facing another type of illness that excludes them from health care coverage. So given that context that we believe the guaranteed national benefits package and the guaranteed nature of coverage for all um, legal residents in the United States, given that context that that is a good thing and a step forward and an improvement for the health of women in this country, then let's answer, talk about the question that you've raised that we're concerned with also. What effect will this proposed schedule of free preventive screening services have on these groups of women. Will things be worse for the women who used to have, who have had access to those services before? Um, will it be not enough for the women who don't have any access right now? Uh, before, to answer that question, I think we have to acknowledge what's been um, briefly mentioned earlier this afternoon, that the recommended um, screening schedule is based on the U.S. Preventive Health Service guidelines. In general, my organization supports using a multidisciplinary body's guidelines as a slightly stronger guarantee that all of the aspects of health care needs are taken into account as compared to recommendations that are made by bodies that are single specialties. Unfortunately, we've had bad experiences with some recommendations from the American Cancer Society and the American College of OBGYNs in the past, not through any ill will on their part, but ACOG recommended routine electronic fetal monitoring during childbirth. That turned out to be not necessary, not helpful, and is being moved away from. ACS used to recommend routine annual screening for lung cancer. That turned out not to save any lives and has been done away with. So we are confident, starting with the U.S. Preventive Health Services screening schedule as a base, but we agree with, I think, what you're going to hear from some of the other women's groups today, that it doesn't completely take into account the diversity of women's needs. And so we have some suggestions for you, since you'll certainly have more power than we will in how the plan ends up becoming finalized and affecting all our lives in the future. So we'd like to make some suggestions for the ways in which the plan can be uh, improved. And many of them are taken right from Mrs. Um, Smart Smith, who spoke earlier. Pap smears, pelvic exams, and other screening tests for diseases that can be transmitted sexually should be offered annually to women at risk, no matter what their age. Starting with those 12-year-olds that Ms. Smart has seen in the Planned Parenthood clinic, going right up to 75-year-old 70, women if they continue to be at risk. And as was said earlier, let's deal in the real world. Let's acknowledge that 
Virtually every teenager who's having sex is at risk of STDs and should be on that annual schedule. Quite a large majority of, uh, of young women are also at risk either through, uh, of STDs, either through their own behavior or the behavior of their husband or boyfriend. So that annual schedule, because of the reality of life in the United States in the 90s, would be really a basic. And then the less frequent would be as is appropriate, as we've, we've seen there's a good scientific grounding for it, but when the woman and, and physician figure out that it's appropriate in that case. The cutoff of free pap smear screening at age 65 should be changed to clarify that free screening must continue for women who've not had screening at all in the past, of whom there are many, and women who have had problems on past pap smears. And then the, clinic, the screening program within the plan should spell out groups of women who are at high risk and make those women clearly eligible for additional free screening, not just um, medically appropriate screening that they'll have to pay a copay for because that won't meet the needs of low-income women. Some of those high-risk groups that we would suggest, women who have known risk factors for breast cancer, women who have, were exposed to DES um, in the uterus, women with HIV disease, women who have a human papillomavirus, the virus that transmits warts and makes women more susceptible for its cervical cancer. In addition, women who've already gone through the menopause before age 50 should be eligible for routine free screening mammograms. Menopause probably is what mammogram makes mammograms work better after age 50. The breasts are easier to image. That isn't absolutely scientifically proven, but it makes enough sense to act now. It's an issue that's of particular importance to African American women who are much more likely to have a hysterectomy, which causes menopause if the ovaries are removed. And adding these expansions and clarifications would take into account the diversity of women's needs, the special diversity of women in, in women of color communities and low-income women. And in conclusion, we think that with these suggestions that we hope you'll be able to carry forward as the plan is introduced and discussed, that women's health will really overall benefit from the health reform proposal and the, the, the um, clinical preventive health services benefit. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Ms. Newbell. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Black Women's Health Project and its membership um, throughout the country on what we consider to be a very important issue, uh, the impact of the administration's health care reform package on black women's health care. As background, the National Black Women's Health Project is a national and international self-help and health advocacy organization committed to improving the overall health status of black women. The core program of our organization is based on the concept and practice of self-help and the inclusion of all women of African descent with a special focus on black women living on low incomes. Mr. Chairman, Although we are extremely supportive of the President's commitment to reforming our health care system and improving the health of our population, some critical adjustments must be made or we will lose serious ground in our effort to preserve and advance the status of women's health. The National Black Women's Health Project is particularly concerned about the plan's recommendations for the frequency of pap smears and mammograms as have been discussed on the previous panel. And raised earlier by Cindy Pearson. We are concerned that if three consecutive pap smears are negative, the plan would not cover another test for three years, which is not consistent, as we've heard before, with the recommendations of the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, and uh, many of the other nationally recognized medical organizations in our country. Uh, this is of particular um, importance uh, for us because cervical cancer is the number two killer of young black women between the ages of 15 and 34. Black women develop cervical cancer almost three times more than white women, and although the survival rate of white women has risen, it has fallen for black women. Uh, the low survival rate is due in part to spotty follow-up care because of a lack of regular source of care. Um, there are other issues, however. Additionally, the rates of uh, death from cervical cancer has decreased by more than 70% since 1950. 
This decrease is associated uh, in large extent to the use of the pap smear and the fact that more women have, are having regular gynecological examinations. The five-year relative survival rate for women with any type of cervical cancer is 67%. Early detection increases the survival rate to 88%. The survival rate of women with cervical carcinoma in situ, which is detected only by the pap smear, approaches 100%. Additionally, the plan covers annual pap smears for women between the ages of 20 and 49 who are at risk for sexually transmitted diseases, but ignores the high rate of STDs among teens. We consider this to be a major issue. According to the Office of Technology Assessment's Report of Adolescent Health, data from the Centers for Disease Control suggests that in 1989, 30% of newly reported gonorrhea cases and 10% of newly reported syphilis cases in the United States occurred among 10 to 19 year olds. This would suggest to us a need to revisit um, uh, pap smear uh, administration in this particular uh, age bracket. Um, additionally, a woman who has had a hysterectomy, we feel, should also have uh, pap smears. Um, her doctor may do the smear less uh, much less frequently depending on the reason for the hysterectomy, but there should not be an automatic assumption that there should be no pap smear once a hysterectomy has occurred. Additionally, uh, for us, the mammogram is of particular interest and, and, and importance. Um, early screening, um, as in cervical cancer, is equally as important with breast cancer. Uh, the plan covers mammograms every two years after the age of 50, um, and 13 medical organizations, including those who went before, recommend that women age 40 and over should have mammograms every one to two years, and yearly breast exams by their physicians. Uh, there additionally, they would recommend that women age 50 and over should have annual mammograms and breast exams. Again, this is a particular item of importance for us. Breast cancer is the leading cause of death for black women between the ages of 15 and 54, and is the number one cause of cancer deaths for black women under 50. Early detection is absolutely critical and crucial to our survival. The survival rate for black women is 63% compared with 78% for white women as is. According to NCI's Attitudes and Usage Survey, income and education levels correlate with getting mammographies. And that's a particular, again, of particular importance uh, for black women in this country. Mr. Chairman, it is the National Black Women's Health Project's strongest recommendation that the health care reform package conform to the guidelines established by medical experts such as NCI, the American Cancer Society, ACOG, as well as a host of the other nationally recognized medical experts. And that uh, health care providers are provided the flexibility to order screening tests based on the health of individual women. And again, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify, testify before the subcommittee. The National Black Women's Health Project looks forward to working with you in the administration and ensuring that the health needs of black women as well as uh, women of color and poor women in this country are addressed, adequately addressed, by our health care reform package. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Ness. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Deborah Ness. I am the Executive Vice President of the Women's Legal Defense Fund, an organization that has worked for over two decades to improve the lives of women and their families. And first, let me thank you, Congressman Towns, for bringing us here today to talk about the critical issue of coverage for pap smears and mammograms. This issue touches the life of every woman and her family in this country, and all too often with tragic consequences. The importance of early detection cannot be overstated. Early detection and improved treatment for breast cancer have kept death rates stable despite increasing rates of incidence. And the death rate for cervical cancer has declined more than 70 percent, due primarily to regular checkups and pap smears. Women's health care is at a very critical and defining moment. The President and this Congress are poised to dramatically reshape our nation's health care system. The outcome of this process will determine for decades to come what health care women have and do not have access to. For the first time, 
all women and men will be guaranteed access to a nationally set package of health care services. Decisions about what is in that package must be based on what is needed to protect our health and well-being. Women, particularly low-income women, who have historically had the most difficulty obtaining basic health care, will be looking to this Congress and to the President to do the right thing. I emphasize this point today because, as you know, there is a long history of women's health issues being given short shrift in this country. There has been an appalling paucity of research into women's health needs and a disgraceful lack of progress in understanding, preventing, and treating diseases that primarily affect women. I also raise this point today because women's health care services, and most especially their reproductive health care services, traditionally have been fragmented, isolated, and marginalized in ways that ignore the critical connection between women's reproductive health and their general health and well-being. And finally, I feel compelled to emphasize this point because decisions about women's reproductive health are all too often determined by politics and what is perceived to be prevailing public opinion rather than sound medical judgment and desired health outcomes. When we reviewed the draft of the administration's initial health care proposal in early September, we were alarmed because the plan appeared to fall short of the promise to ensure that women receive health care that meets currently accepted standards for cancer screening and detection. Our view is that the standards established in the health care plan must reflect whatever are the current standards recommended by the scientific and medical community. In the case of pap smears and clinical breast exams, widely accepted standards for early detection have been set by the American Cancer Society. In the case of mammograms, in 1989, the American Cancer Society was joined by 10 other major medical and scientific organizations in issuing consensus guidelines for mammography screening. As evidence of the broad-based acceptance of these standards, there are 43 states that currently have laws requiring insurance companies to provide coverage for mammograms, and of those, 35 specifically incorporate the consensus guidelines in their mandate. Even though some standards for early cancer detection may be evolving, evolving standards are not an excuse for offering women less than the prevailing standards recommended by the scientific community. We must not allow the incompleteness of our knowledge or the inevitability of change that goes hand in hand with research to justify giving women less now than what we currently believe is the best. Until there is sufficient research to allow cancer experts to reach consensus on revised guidelines, we must provide women with the protection they've come to expect. Furthermore, we must not undermine the goal of prevention by cutting corners. It would be gross hypocrisy to say that prevention is an important goal and then fail to provide those preventive services with the frequency necessary for them to be fully effective. The stage is set now for what will be the most dramatic, far-reaching social reform this nation has experienced in decades. We must work hard now to ensure that the health care services needed by women are included in the nationally guaranteed benefits package. Services not included in this package will quickly become marginalized and if available at all, only to those who can afford to pay. Unfortunately, if the past is any indication of what is to come, there are some who may view women's health care, and especially women's reproductive health care, as an easy target in the fierce game of compromise and trade-offs that lies ahead. This subcommittee's willingness to listen to our concerns gives us hope that women's health issues will not become political fodder to be bargained away when the going gets tough. We face an extraordinary opportunity to improve the health of all people in this nation. And with your continued help and your vigilance, we will not squander that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Chairman Towns, and thank the rest of the committee for inviting us here today. I come before you as a humble but determined voice for the millions of minority and disadvantaged women throughout America 
whose voices often go unheard. As an African-American woman who is a 13-year survivor of breast cancer, a member of the National Cancer Advisory Board, the current chair of the District of Columbia Cancer Consortium, and the founding president of the Breast Cancer Resource Committee, I have the unique advantage of understanding the issues and the difficulties faced by both American women and the medical community with respect to breast cancer screening and treatment issues. My concern here today is to bring focus to the issue of breast cancer screening, specifically new mammography guidelines currently being proposed by the National Cancer Institute. As you no doubt have heard from previous testimonies, breast cancer is the most common non-skin cancer in women in the United States. The National Cancer Institute has, has estimated that there will be a total of 183,000 cases of breast cancer in 1993, with 46,300 deaths. Based on NCI data collected between 1973 and 1990, breast cancer incidence rates for white women were 23.3 versus 24.5 for African American women. Mortality rates are alarmingly different. 1.8 for white women and 17.4 for African American women. Since the late 1970s, medical science and health educators have recognized the important role of prevention and early detection for many cancers, particularly breast cancer. Unfortunately, this cancer prevention message has not been communicated effectively to low-income and minority populations. Many low-income and minority women are still unaware of the importance of monthly breast self-examinations, mammography, and treatment options available to them should there be a malignancy. Early detection and treatment of breast cancer must become a higher priority if we ever envision controlling the high cost of health care in America. To cite a personal example, my late sister, Belva Brissett, was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1989, a third recurrence. She was admitted to the hospital in October of 1990 and died of this dreaded disease in December of that same year. Her hospitalization cost for this two-month period totaled over $100,000. This is in contrast to my own breast cancer treatment cost in 1980 of $7,500. The economics of the situation and the thousands of needless deaths demands our national attention. You've heard the National Cancer Institute's proposed new guidelines. And while I applaud the efforts of the health professional community to develop new guidelines based on the most recent scientific data, I remain very concerned. Once again, Women of America will be further confused by the release of yet another set of guidelines for breast cancer screening. For low-income and minority women, this news will be met with further distrust of the health care delivery system. The resulting effect will most likely be that this group of women will prolong their decision to have mammograms out of confusion. My specific concerns are for those low-income and minority women between the ages of 35 and 49. Data from the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program of the National Cancer Institute indicates that only 7% of breast cancers occur by the age of 40. The risk of developing breast cancer <clears throat> prior to the age of 40 is less than 1%. And although I do not question the validity of this data, my concern is that African American women have historically been left out of major population-based studies. Enough is not yet conclusive as to the biology of the, the disease among this segment of the population. And while we heard a number of studies that were taking place in workshops at the National Cancer Institute, we did not hear about the breast cancer workshop on younger women that was held in January of this year, where there was data released that said that most of the cancer occurring in young women occurred in African American women. Breast cancer mortality rates are alarmingly high for African American women for a variety of reasons, which include, but are not limited to, poverty, lack of awareness of breast cancer as a major health problem, late stage of diagnosis, and lack of access to medical care. In my work with the Belva Brissett Advocacy Center at the Greater Southeast Community Hospital here in Washington, we have seen and heard of too many women whose breast cancers were not detected early, resulting in an increase in the District of Columbia's overall breast cancer mortality rates. While my mission as a breast cancer prevention activist is to increase awareness among women of this disease, I do not do so in a vacuum. My efforts must be supported and reinforced by the medical community, community activism, and the federal government.
the, <clears throat> the medical community must clear the air of the ever-changing guidelines on what women should do with respect to breast cancer screening. Many low-income and minority women are completely baffled by the repeated new guidelines every year or so on mammography. When to get it, how often, and is it safe? The unfortunate result of these controversies is that many women opt to give up, ignore, or postpone life-saving prevention and early detection techniques. Over the past several years, women throughout America have become increasingly vocal regarding their concerns for breast cancer research and the facts about mammography as an effective screening tool. Unfortunately, in early years, African-American women were late in rallying behind this cause. Today, through efforts of local and national African-American women's groups, we are making our issues and our voices heard. Every year for the past three years, the Breast Cancer Resource Committee has brought over 300 African-American women from around the country to discuss breast cancer and women's health issues. We have been able to establish small coalitions throughout the country to educate women in their communities about the importance of early detection of breast and cervical cancers. And today, with the support of several thousand African-American women, the Breast Cancer Research Source Committee stands ready to take the challenge of making our voices heard and our issues known. The federal government's role in this partnership to reduce cancer mortality by 50 percent by the year 2000 can greatly be enhanced by establishing clear guidelines and communicating them effectively to all segments of the population on cancer prevention and screening. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I would like to conclude my testimony today with what I believe are specific and cost-effective solutions to these major health care issues which affect millions of American women. The National Cancer Institute should keep the current guidelines which state that women should have baseline mammograms by age 35, by age 40 every other year, and age 50 a mammogram every year for the rest of her life. These guidelines are for women who are not considered to be at high risk. Low-cost mammography screening should be available to high-risk women. An increase in culturally sensitive health information and education programs needs to be implemented by the federal government to increase the awareness and comprehension of cancer prevention techniques. In addition, the federal government should increase its contracting of minority-owned firms which specialize in health communications, increase the recruitment of more African-American women in population-based studies and clinical trials so that future recommendations are based on solid scientific evidence, and appropriate funds to help state and local communities implement breast and cervical cancer screening programs this is particularly important for women who live in rural areas who often have the least access to health care facilities. And the Department of Health and Human Services should strengthen and enforce guidelines requiring universities who receive federal dollars to include a representative sample of African Americans in scientific research. The federal government should seek the views and opinions of African American researchers, health professionals, and lay public on how to best prevent and combat breast, cervical and other cancers which impact our community. This concludes my testimony and I thank you for inviting me here today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Syntac. Good afternoon. I want to thank you Representative Towns and the Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations for holding this important hearing on the health benefits package as it relates to women's health and for inviting me to represent the issue of breast cancer and the National Breast Cancer Coalition. I am Helene Zintak, a founding board member of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you our thoughts on the implications for breast cancer patients and survivors of the Clinton Health Plan and mammography standards in particular. First, I would like to take a few moments to describe to you the organization I represent. The National Breast Cancer Coalition is a grassroots advocacy organization conceived in January of 1991. Since that time, the coalition has grown to more than 250 organizations representing thousands of patients, their physicians, families, and friends whose primary focus is the eradication of breast cancer. Since 1960, more than 950,000 U.S. women have died of breast cancer. This staggering number is more than two times the number of Americans who died in World War I, World War II, the Korean, Vietnam, and Persian Gulf Wars combined. 46,000 women will die this year. 
A disproportionate number of these deaths will occur among women of low income who belong to a minority group and who are uninsured or underinsured. Too few women have access to high quality care. In breast cancer research, there has been little progress in methods and treatment over the past 20 years. Our coalition's goals are, number one, to increase the funding for breast cancer research with an emphasis on finding the cause and a cure for this insidious disease. Number two, to make certain that all women have access to the quality care and treatment. And number three, to increase the influence of women with breast cancer in the decision making that affects their lives. Today, I want to address some of the broader implications for women with breast cancer if the Clinton plan is implemented, and specifically to discuss with you the issues of mammography and early detection. As I've just said, we, strongly, uh, committed, we are strongly committed to the goal that all women, regardless of economic means, have access to early detection and state-of-the-art treatment. From this perspective, there are many positive aspects of the Clinton Health Care Plan. The Clinton Plan provides health care for all, regardless of employment, health, or marital status. This is critical for women with breast cancer and their families. They will not be locked into jobs only to maintain health insurance or lose their health benefits if they lose their jobs. Also, employers will not be afraid to hire them because of the high cost of insurance. Pre-existing conditions will no longer prevent anyone from receiving health care coverage. We will no longer see the travesty of breast cancer patients being denied health insurance coverage because of the very fact of their disease. The Clinton plan, if implemented, will also guarantee that everyone would have access to quality care regardless of economic status. Currently, women who are uninsured can wait long periods of time for treatment of breast cancer. Their ch chance of survival diminishes as their weight increases. The data from the African American community makes this point in very stark terms. Although fewer African American women are diagnosed with breast cancer, a larger percent die from the disease. We believe uh, that the failure of the health care system to afford early detection and state-of-the-art treatment to underserved women is the major reason that African American women die in disproportionate numbers from this horrible illness. Finally, the Clinton plan is positive for breast cancer patients because it includes coverage of medically appropriate care when it is provided as part of an approved clinical trial. Right now, many insurance policies do not cover these costs, thereby limiting the participation in potentially life-saving clinical trials to women who can afford to pay these sizable expenses out of pocket. Now, our specific uh, concern about mammography. First, I want to applaud the administration for including screening mam mammograms in the benefit package. As you know, many insurance companies now do not reimburse for screening at any age or at any frequency. This inclusion, even if limited, is a very positive step in the right direction. But as you know, strong concern has been raised from women's health advocates and from women members of Congress about the health plan's proposed limitations on the coverage of mammography. The administration proposes to limit coverage because there are very real, real questions about the efficacy of screening mammograms for women of different ages and for screening at different intervals. It is the assessment of the National Breast Cancer Coalition that the, we simply do not have enough scientific data to make a decision to limit availability to these tests. The scientific data do not exist to justify the current guidelines when they were created. Today, we believe there is a lack of scientific data to change them. Therefore, the National Breast Cancer Coalition strongly recommends a dual strategy. First, immediately launch a nationwide system of randomized clinical trials of various screening mechanisms to answer these critical questions. And second, until we have the results from that trial, maintain current mammography guidelines without any change. I know that you will agree that the worst thing for a woman is confusion and mixed signals. Confusion will lead to inaction, and inaction will lead to more deaths. But there may be a silver lining created by all this ruckus about mammography, its efficacy and frequency, as well as of its coverage. 
public policymakers are beginning to become painfully aware of the inadequacy of mammography as a screening technique. For the past 10 years, mammograms have been incorrectly referred to as prevention, even by people who know better. This has led to a false sense of security. Mammography will not prevent breast cancer. It is a diagnostic tool that may prevent mortality in some cases when followed by appropriate treatment. If the data cited, cited by the Clinton administration is correct, that mammograms for women under 50 are not efficacious, then what is available for these women? Breast cancer is the leading cause of death for women ages 35 to 52. What do we tell these women to do? Hope? Pray? Our public education campaigns in recent years have lulled women into a false sense of security. If they get their mammograms, there is a 90% cure rate. The data actually is that there may be a 90% five-year survival rate, but the women are not necessarily cured. Apparently now we are altering our message. We are telling women under 50 that mammograms are not efficacious. And we are telling older women that screening every two years is okay. What are we telling the 46,000 women who are going to die this year? What should they have done, could have done? The National Breast Cancer Coalition has urged for the past three years that we need better screening techniques. We need a blood test. We need to identify early markers. For some women, their breast cancer has existed for as much as seven years before it was diagnosed by a quality mammogram. All of this is yet another graphic illustration of how the health of women suffers because not enough research attention has been dedicated to women's health needs. Decisions regarding breast cancer detection are being made without a sound basis in research. Our other difficulty with proposals regarding mammography has to do with reimbursement. Currently, there is discussion that the Clinton plan will expand full reimbursement for mammograms for high-risk women if the mammogram is recommended by their physician. But only 30% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have any indications of high risk. Do we want to send the wrong signal to over 70% of women uh, that mammograms are not necessary? In fact, as this epidemic continues to rage through this nation, our fam only family history and age have emerged as truly significant risk factors. All others are only marginal. Nearly all women carry some risk for this disease. How will their breast cancer be detected? Will it be too late? It is likely that only highly motivated women will be assertive enough with their doctors to insist on receiving a mammogram. Mammograms will be available for other women if recommended by their doctor, but the women who have to pay the cost or for women who can pay the cost. What will the result be for poor women? In conclusion, this debate on these guidelines has made it painfully clear we lack a good means of early detection of breast cancer. As we all work together on this particular aspect of the Clinton plan, screening once a year or every two years, what age, etc., we cannot afford to lose sight of the bigger question. How can we marshal our resources to look for new methods of detection and discover a cure? Since we do not know what causes breast cancer or what to do to prevent it, there is very little a woman can do, and that is the message. As this message is heard, we believe that a larger group of women will join the chorus of women who are already demanding change. This Monday, the National Breast Cancer Coalition will deliver to President Clinton more than 2.6 million signatures representing the women diagnosed with breast cancer in our country. With these petitions, petitions, we are asking him to direct a national strategy to find the cause of and a cure for this deadly epidemic. A part of the national strategy will be focused on discovering new means for early detection for women of all ages. So we employ the members of the committee and the public as we try to determine the best guidelines for mammograms to be aware of their very serious limitations and that we redouble our efforts to find much better means of detection, but more importantly, find the cause and the cure for this dread disease. The rapidly increasing numbers of women diagnosed with breast cancer are truly frightening. We must intervene to stop this deadly epidemic. We need your help. Thank you very much. Let me thank all of you for your testimony and uh, uh, 
I think that someone sort of indicated that uh, this is uh, early on talked about in terms of um, the, the magnitude in terms of the, the problems uh, that we're facing in terms of as we begin to look at the proposal. Uh, this is probably the most revolutionary piece of legislation that the Congress will probably ever even entertain. I think it's bigger than Social Security. I think it's bigger than anything that uh, we've probably dealt with. I know it's bigger than anything I've dealt with since I've been here. Uh, and I think that it's going to require a lot of work and uh, a lot of questions will have to be raised in, uh, in order to get a lot of answers to make certain that uh, we are moving in the right direction. You know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a definition of high risk will have to be established uh, to, to the point where everybody sort of feels comfortable with it. Uh, because as I listened to the witnesses earlier and then I listened to you, you know, I'm not sure that we know what a definition of high risk is. Uh, uh, we, we're hearing some things, and I listened to the medical profession as they talked, and then, of course, uh, uh, then I listened to uh, you. Uh, is anyone prepared to give me a definition of high risk? <laughs> I think that what needs to be kept in mind is that the majority of women diagnosed with breast cancer are not at high risk. Um, family history and age are two of the things that, that they can definitely pinpoint as risk factors, but that leaves a very large number of women who aren't being considered or are not a priority. Any other comments on that? Let, let, me, let, me, let me ask the question this way. Let me switch seats with you. I've been in the Congress 11 years, chair of this committee, on the health committee, and uh, looking for directions and guidance. So why don't I just switch positions with you right now? You are now a member of Congress. What would you do? Let me tell you what I think. My definition of high risk is women. And one other thing, breasts. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> if you have breasts, you are at risk for breast cancer. I am considered a high risk woman because I have such a strong family history of uh, four generations, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, a mother, and three sisters who all had breast cancer. But I also consider myself very fortunate because I knew about this disease. There are so many women who have breast and breast cancer who never knew about it. And most of the women who are affiliated with my organization are women under the age of 50, most under the age of 40, who have no risk factors and have breast cancer. They are African-American women we don't know if our biology is different than white women. We talked about all of the studies that have been done on European women. We are not European, nor are we of European extract. So we consider ourselves to be high risk because there are no studies done on us. So any woman who has breast is high risk. Mr. Towns, to answer your question, if we were members of Congress, I think I can say that for the National Women's Health Network, we would be looking for a proposal that guaranteed coverage to everyone, that didn't put financial barriers in the way of coverage, that um, gave flexibility to acknowledge the different needs of women and of uh, people of color communities who might ha want to seek out different types of providers um, who are more respectful of them and their needs, and that encouraged prevention and detect detection techniques that balanced between having been studied well enough to have proven effectiveness and being offered in a flexible enough way that it met the variety of needs of women who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds and different risk backgrounds. And it's a, we'd probably be having just a hard as a time as you are <laughs> if we were members of Congress. Yes. I think I would also point out that this whole discussion um, highlights how little we know about the set of health issues. And that gets back to the point that was raised by a number of witnesses, that there's been an appalling lack of research and attention to women's health, health issues for decades now. And we're just beginning to reverse that. So one of the things that um, is very helpful is to keep the momentum going and striving for more information, doing the kind of research that would give us the answers. I think the, the statistics are something like only 30% of women who fall in um, those high-risk categories are um, actually part of the pool that get breast cancer. Of the other 70 percent, never fall into those high-risk categories, but they get breast cancer. It shows how little we know. Um, and so I would urge us to pay attention to right now making sure women 
get the best possible preventive services that they can that we know about at this point in time and at the same time keep pushing on the front of increased money for research so we can get answers to these questions. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that um, additionally in terms of definition that being black, female, and poor in America is something that needs to be uh, looked at from our perspective. The statistics certainly bear out the fact that uh, for black women be between 15 and 54, breast cancer, for example, is a leading cause of death. And for uh, one of the causes of death for black women under 50, um, also a high cause of death for that population. I, so that I think those issues, I think that adequate research has not been done um, to um, further investigate for black women uh, the issues of cancer. Um, but I think that given what we do know, what we know about the incidents, what we know about mortality, what we know about um, uh, this being a, a leading cause of death, that that bears uh, for us some inclusion in the definition of risk. I think that while it's not the subject um, of this, um, this particular committee meeting, I think poverty is an issue we have to look at. We have to understand something about dumping toxic waste and poor black and other people of com uh, color communities and then looking at what kind of cancer rates follow that kind of situation. So um, certainly uh, poverty, certainly being black, certainly being female in America within and certainly looking at specific uh, age ranges uh, would also be issues that we want to have considered in a definition of risk. Okay, let me, let me I have one other comment about um, sitting in your seat. In terms of research, I serve on the National Cancer Advisory Board and I look at a lot of, of research proposals. Most of them look the same. Most of the ones that get funded look the same. We don't fund new researchers because they have no track record. They have no track record because nobody funds them. You know, it's a catch-22 situation. Some of them have some very novel ideas. And I have often begged the NCI to set up a pool of funds to just, maybe we're just giving money away. Maybe nothing will come of it. But we have been conducting research around this issue for many years, and we have no cure. We don't know what causes the disease. We aren't close to finding what causes the disease, as far as I know. And I think that we need to start to look at how the research is funded. I think there's a cottage industry that has grown up around research. And I'm very concerned about what kinds of projects we are putting money into. You know, I must admit that uh, uh, that's a real concern. You know, because even in the areas that we do know that work, for some reason or another, we don't give it the kind of support that we should give it. We know that diet plays a part. And uh, uh, for some reason or another, we do not spend, spend very little in terms of getting that kind of information out to the public. Uh, so uh, I agree with you. I think that uh, we need to take a look at what we know that works and be supportive of it, but at the same time, you know, not be so myopic in terms of our own research that we just keep going down the same road all the time. I really feel that we need to do some things differently. I agree with you. And uh, let me just sort of thank all of you for your testimony and you've been extremely helpful to us in, uh, uh, in so many ways. So thanks again for your time. And I'm certain that as we move forward, that we'll be calling on you uh, as we try to formulate a package that uh, is going to be the kind of package that we feel that will protect every woman in America. And uh, thank you for your assistance in terms of helping us to arrive at that point. Thank you again for your testimony. And that, may I just also add uh, that the... Uh, Record be open uh, for at least to Tuesday, uh, the closing of the business on Tuesday, and that the uh, Sanders and Payne's testimony be inserted into the records without objection. And being, and being there's no members here, nobody can object. Uh, <laughs> can, can we have also, that the questions will also be in it uh, without objections. At this time, let me uh, conclude the uh, hearing and to say to you that the hearing is now concluded and the record will be open until Tuesday.
A programming note that Friday afternoon, Gordon Binder, chairman of Amjam Incorporated, was the guest speaker at a National Press Club luncheon. He talked to the group about the impact of health care reform on the biotechnology industry. And you can see Mr. Binder's speech Saturday morning beginning at 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 a.m. Pacific Time here on C-SPAN. Coming next, we'll update the schedule. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network and its companion network, C-SPAN 2, are funded entirely by...